Welcome, everybody. Thank you um, for coming. Uh, this is February 28th PVUSD board meeting, and um, we are going to go into closed session from 6 to 7 o'clock. Um, do we have any speakers to any of our closed session items? Seeing none, yes. Okay. So, so I'll, sir, I'll probably just signal you. I don't think we have our, do we have our timer? Okay, so we're three minutes per yes, speaker. Thank you for that. coming. Yes, good evening. I'm Robert Chakanaka, president of the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council. I'm also an AFT local president in Santa Cruz. And uh, I'm here to support the Paro Valley Federation of Teachers. And I have some information I wanted to hand to you that comes from school services, which just came out a couple days ago. I think you're going to find quite interesting. It's uh, going to inform you, and I can read the first paragraph. With the revised governor's budget's revenue forecast just over a month old, as you know, last December, members from your board as well as members from your unions went to Sacramento. Uh, state general fund revenues for January 2018 are up a whopping $2.6 billion over the revised forecast. December tax receipts, which are not separately reported, were up 26, I mean, 29, $296 million. Thus, year to date, the revenues are $2.9 billion above the forecast level of 3.9%. So I'd like to hand you this so you can see. We'd encourage you to negotiate in good faith with the PVF. Uh, they might take against um, um, this school board and this school district. And, you know, I, we always hope that it never comes to that. We always hope that you can work it out. We've always been, I, I've negotiated a lot of contracts, and I tell you what, it's a lot easier and a lot better if you can work it out. You want good, school, good qualified school teachers, um, you have to pay. You have to pay some decent wages. Uh, we live in, a, in both Santa Cruz County and Monterey County, very expensive counties. And so for these individuals, uh, to reside in here. Uh, you need to get uh, some qualified, good paid, uh, qualified individuals. So I just wanted to make sure that it's on the record that we're supporting um, AFT Local 19 foot 36. Thank you. Hi, I'm Parker. And I think we should I don't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> I think we should keep our teachers because we don't want a bunch of random, untrained college students teaching 30, cla 30 kid classes. And so to not have a bunch of random, not trained people, we need to pay. So if I can just have you hold for a second. Ava, do we have our, um, our comment cards? And on the end, for those of you that are speaking, we, we do need comment cards filled out. If you could do that, and even those who have spoken, just so we have it on record, that would be great. Thank you. Good evening, board members. I'm Nira Bitnagar. I'm a parent at Mar Vista Elementary. That's my son, Leland, and his friend, Parker, who just spoke. I'm also here to represent SEIU 521, as well as I said, being a parent. Um, Mar Vista Elementary has some of the best teachers we've ever experienced, and we did go to another local school district for one year to experience it as well. And comparatively, Mar Vista PVUSD is exceptional and phenomenal. Not only has my son had the experience of having teachers who have vast knowledge, are highly trained, and passionate and committed to their training, he's also had some special services in the district, and those folks as well provided exceptional 
commitment to him and providing him with what he needed to be successful. And they also made their effort to communicate with me beyond regular hours as a parent who works full time. I appreciate that. I'm highly involved in the school as a parent. I'm on the board at the school. And what makes our school community so amazing is the involvement of our parents as well as our teachers who come to our events, who support our children, who show up at sporting events. Again, they go above and beyond to get to know our children and be part of their lives. Our local SEIU 521 union represents hundreds of people like me who live in the Pajaro Valley in both Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. Many of our members have children who attend the schools in PVUSD. Many have family members who work for PVUSD. And many of our members vote for PVUSD. Our union, which represents over 5,000 members in the Monterey Bay region alone, stand in support of the teachers of the PVUSD and are ready to back them up as they get to work towards a fair contract. We support PVFT in all their actions, including striking, which we, of course we don't want to happen as it affects our children, but we do support them. Please do what is right and offer a fair contract to our teachers. Time's up already. My name is Jennifer Holm. Um, I am a registered nurse at Watsonville Community Hospital. I have the privilege of serving on the board of directors of the California Nurses Association, and I'm also a PVUSD parent. By the time my youngest will graduate from Aptos High, I will have had a child at one of the schools in the district for 23 years. Um, I'm invested in the teachers. I'm invested in the students. This is our community, our community. Teachers have come out to support nurses in our contract negotiations many times, and um, we've had board members as well. Thank you. Um, the nurses will support the teachers. I have had difficult conversations in the break room when I'm at work about you know where people are choosing to send their kids, and you know we're losing we're losing families to private schools, and we have such good schools here. Invest in the teachers, please. Education is one of the key predictors of lifelong health literacy. This is, inc this is critically important to, to, to our communities and to our, the families that live here. And if you're standing in opposition to what the teachers need, then let's take a look at what you're standing for. Um, so please, the nurses will stand with the teachers. Um, we ask that you do as well in the contract negotiations. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jovita Dominguez. I'm a registered nurse at Salinas Valley Memorial. I would CNA and I support the PF, the Pajaro Valley teachers. I have children, my last one, um, uh, we're at North County, my last one is a senior, and I know the importance of being uh, a supportive parent. I've been supportive throughout my kids' um, education, and I think public schools are much better than private schools. And please support the teachers. Good evening, uh, Cesar Lara. I'm a Teamsters uh, Union 890 out of Salinas, but we have hundreds of members that live here uh, in Watsonville. Um, I'm also staff at the Monterey Bay Central Labor Council. And I think my colleagues said, said it clearly, and actually um, the clear message was the students. I think retention of the teachers you have now uh, is important. So as you go into negotiations, um, we look further uh, towards the school district acting in good faith uh, and uh, working with the teachers to come up with a, a contract that is right for the workers that are in the front line with the students. Um, at, at the end, um, as, as a member of the Labor Council, uh, the Teamsters will stand with the union if they ask for strike authorization. I think that my sisters in, and brothers in the unions that have spoken ahead of me and the members that are speaking behind me, uh, we want to be very clear. Um, we rarely come to school districts uh, at points like this because issues get settled beforehand. 
this is taking a long time. And it's coming to a point where we don't want to disturb the students uh, as they're going through their educational life with a strike. But we as labor unions, because we represent uh, people in your community that have students that go to your schools, we will stand with the teachers. Um, we will stand for what's right. I, I know that teachers don't want to do that. They come to their profession for the love of the students and, and the love of teaching. And that's the last thing they want to do is do it, but they have to stand up for what's right. And times are difficult, but um, my colleague um, with, the, um, with the Labor Council said earlier, if you look at the state forecast, we, we have money coming in. So we don't quite understand what's, what's happening at the negotiation table. And we will defer to uh, what we hear from the teachers and we'll stand with them. So thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, Eduardo Montesino. Um, as a parent um, that, that has, um, but also a bus driver that represents over um, 200 um, bus operators in the county, um, but specifically here in in Watsonville, with a lot of families that have uh, voted for a lot of you guys and 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 are in very much support of, of the teachers. Um, we need we need you guys to step up and, and settle this. It's taken a long time. Um, we need to be supportive of our community, it, of our kids, our students. We need to be able to attract more uh, more professional teachers because we want to make the best district uh, um, in the county. We want our kids to succeed in life. And the only way for us, um, for them to succeed is for, um, uh, for us to uh, retain and attract good teachers. And by not settling, it's not helping the cause. We need um, everyone to just, you know, sit down and, and get this done. Um, our, our families depend on it. I have three kids, one in each school. I got one in elementary, one in middle school, and one in high school. You know, I, and the other day I was um, I was taking my the, in middle school to Rolling Hills, and they were, why are there te why is there a lot of teachers out there? I'm like, and I had to explain, you know, um, well they're out there to be able to have respect, to be able to live in our community. It's hard to live in a community, it's high, high cost, you know, it's hard, you know, housing, um, just everything's going up. And you know it's becoming unaffordable, so we need um, we need we need you to show some respect for some of the teachers. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Danielle Dodge. I'm here with the Carrillo College Federation of Teachers AFT 4400. I am the executive director. Um, I wanted to be able to. Uh, we passed a resolution, the Cabrillo College Federation of Teachers passed a resolution in support of our brothers and sisters at Paro Valley Federation of Teachers. We are here to show our support of the 1,200 members and families of the Paro Valley Federation of Teachers. As a union that has over 550 members and hundreds of families that attend the Paro Valley Unified School District, we are asking you to support the teachers in your negotiations. We live in one of the most expensive areas in the world, Working class families struggle every day. Please show your support to working families here in our community. We are here to also acknowledge that we will, I want to be on record, that we will support the Cabrillo College Federation of Teachers, will support all actions of the Paro Valley Unified, excuse me, Paro Valley Federation of Teachers, including a strike. As someone who's lived through something that in the community, we recognize that that doesn't help anybody and leaves scars to heels you have the opportunity to be able to change that and to set us on a different direction. Please support the Barrow Valley Federation of Teachers. In your, thank you. So yeah, for those who have cards, you can turn them in right here. And if there are no other speakers, we're gonna go ahead and um, go to closed session. We'll be back at seven o'clock for our open session. Thank you.
Welcome, everybody. Um, we're happy to have you all here. It's uh, February 28th, 2018 PVUSD school board meeting. And sorry, we're a couple of minutes late. Um, again, thank you for coming here. Um, we are going to go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'll ask Trustee Ursino to lead us. All right. I, of the United States of America, and to the public for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I kind of just did welcome before the, <laughs> the pledge, so I will go ahead and go to item 3.3, superintendent's comments. Yes, well, good evening. Well, this past Friday, I had the opportunity to complete another day in the life of. This time, I was a site tech at Aptos High School with um, Jeff Ramos, and you'll see me up on the screen with him. I was so impressed with his high level of technical knowledge his willingness to support our teachers and staff with any of their needs, um, support or training that they needed. So I really want to thank Jeff for his dedication and commitment to our district. So este pasado viernes tuve la oportunidad de completar otro día en la vida de. Esta vez fui un técnico, técnico escolar en la prepa de Aptos con Jeff um, Ramos. Me impresionó su alto nivel de conocimiento técnico, su disposición para apoyar a todos los maestros y personal con cualquier necesidad, apoyo. Um, quiero agradecer a Jeff por su dedicación y con permiso a nuestro distrito. And we also had our parent conference this past week, and Dr. Gottlieb and her team did a spectacular job preparing for the conference to ensure that it went off without a hitch. Um, parents heard a keynote speaker on key learnings, attended three workshops, and also attended a resource fair. So thank you to Dr. Gottlieb and her team. So tuvimos nuestra conferencia de padres este fin de semana pasado. La doctora Gottlieb y su equipo hicieron un, tra un trabajo espectacular con la preparación de la conferencia para asegurarse que se, se llevará a cabo sin ningún contratiempo. Los padres escucharon un orador principal sobre aprendizajes claves, participaron en tres talleres y asistieron a una feria de recursos. So, gracias a la doctora Gottlieb y su equipo. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. And if anybody in the audience does need translation services, we, you can go over to the booth right here and see our translator, and she does have equipment. Um, so that is available at all of our board meetings. Leslie, I'll just say it in Spanish. Yes. Um, buenas noches. Uh, solo queríamos informarles que tenemos um, servicios de traducción. Si quieren, necesitan traducción, la señora Virginia puede ayudarlos con eso. Thank you. So on to item 3.4. Um, I'm thrilled uh, that we, we get to introduce a new education leader in our community. On February 1st, Cabrillo College welcomed a new president, Dr. Matthew Wedstein, who comes from San Joaquin Delta College. And um, uh, it's been a real joy to welcome him. He's been uh, very good about open office hours. Some may know I work at Cabrillo, so I got to go and introduce myself to him, and um, we're looking forward to having him there. And then um, I also wanted, wanted to recognize Cabrillo trustee Leticia Mendoza is also here in the, in the audience. Um, if you would like to come up and um, introduce yourself, that would be great. And also the president, too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Leticia Mendoza, I'm trustee um, for uh, Area 5, which includes Cabrillo College. And it is a pleasure to introduce Dr. Matthew, who um, we just began working with him. But the relation with Cabrillo is really important um, for for us as students, when I was a student at Guatemala High School, I had the opportunity to be introduced to college life because Cabrillo College had um, 
a workshop and so that we could learn about colleges. So I know the importance of Cabrillo. And um, we are just very, very happy to have someone with such professionalism and drive to, um, to be now working with us in Cabrillo. So, Dr. Matthew, please. Well, thank you, um, Leticia and Ed. Thank you for being here to support me. And uh, and I did not mean to. I didn't see you, Ed. You're sitting. This is Ed Banks, trustee, also <laughs> with Cabrillo. Yes, thanks, uh, Ed. And thank you, Leslie, for the introduction and the the opportunity to just speak briefly to you, members of the board, Michelle. Uh, it's a real honor for me to be the president of Cabrillo and to be chosen to represent this uh, community on behalf of college students here. Um, I'm mindful of the importance of Watsonville students to our future as a college. Um, one of the first facts I learned in studying about Cabrillo was that the, the most important feeder high school for the college is Watsonville High School. Uh, and our relationships with this district are, are key to ensuring that we have uh, high quality programs for our students and also that we're training students for living wage jobs. Um, I've already met Michelle. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Uh, I've met uh, Dr. B, Nancy, and uh, where'd she go? You hiding from me? Um, we had a, uh, a wonderful adult education advisory board meeting that I was invited to. Thank you for the invitation to that. And I look forward to working with you on adult ed um, relationships and programs. Um, the college is an important asset. I'm mindful of that. I want, I want to do the best that I can for this community students. Uh, I will tell you that I'll work uh, as hard as I can. The other thing that I've learned just briefly is that when people say over the hill here, it means not old people. It means <laughs> going over Highway 17. I learned that the other day in a meeting. And so, um, but it's been wonderful. I've had a, a great introduction to the community. People have been so welcoming and receptive. And I, I very much look forward to working with you all. Uh, with the, the staff of the, of the school district. And if there's anything that I can do to help your students transition to Cabrillo, I'm here for you. So I will leave some business cards with uh, your staff to pass around. Do feel free to call me at any time, board members, um, if you need to get in touch, or, or certainly Michelle. So thank you very much. And welcome. Okay, we'll move on to item um, 3.5, one of our favorites. Um, this is our student recognition, and we have two students this evening. Uh, we'll start with Landmark Elementary's Caitlin Ruiz. Everybody that's here to support Caitlin, please come up to the podium, including Caitlin. Well, good evening, uh, President DeRose, uh, Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez, and the board members. Um, my name is Mr. Torres. I'm Landmark Principal, and it's actually my pleasure to introduce Ms. Caitlin Ruiz as our Student of the Year. Woohoo! As you guys can see, super sweet smile. Can you guys hear? Oh, look at that. It actually lowers. Nice. Say hi to everybody. <laughs> so I just want to say a couple words, and I'll invite Ms. Kaysen to say something as well. Um, I've had the pleasure of seeing this uh, young gal grow up in front of my eyes. Um, her and um, my own kiddo actually went to the same daycare as little guys, and I've, I, I accidentally called her KK at school, and she was like, what? <laughs> but that, that's how I knew her, and she's blossomed into quite a um, wonderful young um student at our school. Um, she's always very forward thinking and she's very empathetic to our um, school and community. So I really appreciate that side of her. She's super, a super strong leader um, and, you know, just all around a very great landmark dragonfly. So I'd like to invite Ms. Um, Kaysen up to just say a couple words as well. Hi, good evening. My name is Jenna Kaysen. I'm Caitlin's teacher. I'm very proud of Caitlin. She 
really stands out to me. She's always ready to participate in class, always very responsible, and always there for her friends no matter what. She's really always thinking about others and, you know, how are they doing and how can I help them? So I'm very proud of you. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, Caitlin. Okay, and next we have from Mar Vista, Iman Mashari. Come on up with your whole support group. Got an entourage. <clears throat> uh, good evening, President DeRose, Superintendent Rodriguez, and board members. It is with great pre pleasure and pride that we introduce Iman Moshari as Mar Vista School Student of the Year. Something that I ask of my students on a daily basis, and of myself for that matter, is for them to be their greatest self that they can be on any given day. Some days our greatest may not match up to what it was a few days before, depending on what's going on in our lives, but I always encourage them to be their greatest self on any given day in whatever it is that they are doing. And the thing is, and I realized this pretty early on with Iman, I didn't need to get that message across to him. Whether this trait is innate in his personality or whether this comes from his amazing family or is a combination of the two, he takes ownership over being his greatest self daily in everything he does. For me, I can't ask anything more of my students. From any acad academic area to athletics, even when challenging me one-on-one -on -one to a basketball game, <laughs> video editing, friendships, group work, supporting others in need, to his work in student council, to helping any new student feel welcome, to being an appreciative, caring person, and in general to doing whatever he can to help the school as a whole. He puts 100% into everything he does and always strives to be his greatest self. Furthermore, he does, he does all of this with an incredibly charismatic personality, a smile on his face, and a great, great sense of humor. I can honestly say that he is one of the most well-rounded and balanced students that I have ever worked with. It is truly a pleasure to get to work with him and to get to know him for that matter, and there is no doubt in my mind that he is going to do great things in this world. And I believe he has some things to say as well. Good evening, President DeRose. I hope I said that right. Superintendent Rodriguez, and board members. I'm honored to receive this award along with the other student here with me. Really quickly, I'd like to share out the names of the people who have helped me along the way to make me reach what is before me. Starting off, my mom was a tremendous help with, my mom was a tremendous help in many things, along with my stepdad who worked to, to help us stay alive and live under a roof. This next one, is to all my teachers who have taught me to be kind, respectful, and a responsible person. Furthermore, I wanna thank my principal for being the best principal I've ever had. Since he is my principal, I will have to say something else about him. I wanna say that Mr. D is sadly retiring uh, 
after 19 or something years of being vice principal at Aptos Junior High, and I think about four or three years of being principal at Mar Vista Elementary School. The very last thing is I want to thank all my friends for coming here and supporting me and just blankly being my friends and my awesome little sister who always looks up to me for help and just blankly being my sister. My last and only request is a round of applause to all these people that I mentioned and then I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thank you and congratulations again to both of our wonderful students. Okay, item 3.6 is governing board comments and report on standing committee meetings. Um, I will go ahead and start at the end down here with Jeff. Do you have any comments? I have nothing to report. Cynthia Costa. Um, yes, I just wanted to um, bring light, I guess, to the issue that I know I've been in contact with Michelle regarding the issue with the portable for the after school girls program out at Lakeview, as Lakeview is in my trustee area, and I have been reached out to by constituents in the area with regards to how valuable this program is, this after school program is for the students in our area or at Lakeview School. Um, based on the conversations, it seems that the only roadblock at this point with getting this portable is a funding issue. So I wanted to just, you know, implore the district's administration to see what can be done to, you know, get past this gridlock with the matching funds that the county is willing to offer to move this and progress it forward. Um, and then hopefully have the administration bring it back to this governing board so we can vote on it and make a decision with regards to that. Excuse me, President. Um, this is a time for us to report out on our standing committees, um, and that seems like an issue that can be brought um, to the attention of the superintendent or the president at a different time. Mm -hmm. Or if you, if or you ask for agenda, it to be agendized. Right. That's basically what I'm asking for, is it to be agendized. That's why I'm bringing it forward. Thank you. <clears throat> so is, is this on, I guess? Mm -hmm. Um, so I did get to meet the president of Cabrillo at the Adult Education Advisory Board. So I was able to, to meet him there. That was cool. And um, I also went to the parent conference, not the whole day because I was having to work, but I actually went to their breakfast, their keynote speaker, and, and I went to one workshop. I went to one workshop. I did that. <laughs> so I was able to partic participate in the parent conference. And I also went to a meeting for Migrant Head Start. Um, they have an executive meet, uh, committee that meets when they're 
um, program is not in operation because their program will start in, you know, the beginning of April, the very end of March um, is, is when they're, you know, all their home providers and their daycare and everything is going to be going, but we have to have a couple of executive board meetings to work on, um, you know, budget issues and what's going to happen when it opens and other things like that. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I didn't report on this last time, but I did go to our um, SELPA meeting, our monthly SELPA meeting, uh, which had a great presentation. And actually, I was so surprised what a great turnout it was. Just tons of Spanish-speaking um, moms and dads there trying to learn more about our special education system. So I thought that was really great. Um, I also attended a United Way um, meeting yesterday where they rolled out their new funding um, ideas and got uh, a lot of ideas and support for how to um, push forward academic and other success for youth. That's going to be their new funding criteria, essentially. So I learned um, all about um, how to uh, sort of push forward and apply for those funds, and I was really very pleased to see our grant writer, Andrea Willie, in attendance. Um, there'll be a lot of um, opportunity for the Pajaro Valley to receive extensive funding for um, success for youth. So looking forward to getting a piece of that for kids in our district, perhaps our educational foundation, and also um, Pajaro Valley Prevention. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, Cabrillo College is, uh, um, has a, a big part in my heart. Uh, I was in the first class ever, uh, 1959, when, when it was formed and opened at the Watsonville High School campus. So I was in the Watsonville High School class of 1959. Cabrillo opened just in the nick of time. So thank all of you very much. The other, uh, the other, the other announcement I want to make: uh, the, um, um, the parent um, meeting the other day was outstanding, and and I uh, went to one session on uh, gangs, and and I just want to report to all of you that the work that the Watsonville Police Department, working with the school district, has been just really, really wonderful, and my respect is uh, has risen. Because when I saw the weapons that, that they see every afternoon out on the streets, it is enough to make us all afraid. These things are happening every afternoon out here. So what, what I want to do is to see if we can bring this to the board agenda and see if we can coordinate all of the good things that are happening within, within the school district. We don't, we don't ever see some of this stuff, but... When um, Measure L was first passed, people were saying, what's happening? We don't, we don't actually see anything happening. Facilities went around and changed the um, locks on all, all of the doors just to make us safe. And so these are, these are some of the things that we don't see but are happening out, out there. Every, every room now has a phone by the uh, front door so that the... Um, so that the uh, teachers can actually run over there, pick up the phone, and utilize it. So wonderful things are happening. We just need to bring them out and see if we can put everything together. Uh, last um, meeting, we also heard the uh, report from PV, PVPSA on uh, mental health. And these things work together, but we need to be able to put them together so that we all understand safety is really, really important. Minty White just has a, had a, a fence put around the school. It looks wonderful, but, it's, but it was actually part of the safety program there at the same time. So, so I just want to bring these things out to us and uh, see if we can agendize this in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Hero. Um, so last week I didn't... Um, uh, make a comment about this, but PVOSD was chosen as one of the benefactors from the the AT&T Pro-Am Chevron shootout 
know if anyone knows what that is, but any time one of the players during the tournament hits an eagle, which is two under par, I believe, um, there was a $5,000 prize. I believe there was four or five different um, nonprofits or agencies, uh, school districts, who were going to split that money at the end. I don't know what the total was. Did, did you happen to hear what that was for, for PVUSD? They didn't have that many eagles this time, so we received the minimum of $30,000. Okay, that well, was that's promised. pretty good. Um, and um, it was really fun to be able to attend the last day of the tournament and um, see the winner. And we got to see our logo on the sign. I, I wish I would have thought of it. Um, we have pictures of our, our uh, logo on the sign, which you can actually see if you were watching it on television. If someone had the camera at the 18th hole, the sign was right there. So we got really good placement. So I wanted to thank Chevron and the Monterey Peninsula Foundation uh, for supporting PVUSD. Um, also, I attended the parent conference as well. And um, excellent job, Dr. Gottlieb and your staff. Um, that was a huge undertaking. I, I'm thinking, I don't know, several hundred, 500, 600 parents, something like that. It was really, really well done. Um, one of the workshops that I wanted to mention that, that I went to was pre presented by our, our partners, the Community Action Board, and I was really, really pleased to hear that they are working on a grant where they're offering s support to our families uh, w with immigration issues, and not only that, but they are offering training to our uh, school site staff on uh, what to do if they're confronted with uh, somebody asking for information about our families. So um, really, really positive news there, and um, I was really happy to be able to attend that. So that's all for me. Thank you. And we will move on to um, item 4.0 is approval of the agenda. So moved. Do I have to second her before I go anywhere? So I second Kim, but with a revision. I would like to move 10.4, which is the uh, which is the assistant superintendent's negotiate not negotiations um, contract Contracts. renewal contract. Thank you to write out to the agenda. Okay. Um, will you modify your motion, Kim? Sure. The Not reason sure why we're doing why that doing is it? because I'm going to have to leave early. Oh, thank you. I yeah. just needed some backup. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was like, why? Okay. Yeah, I modify my motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you. So item 10.4, and this is a report by Dr. Rodriguez, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So um, within the next couple of months, um, we have three assistant superintendents that whose contract will be expiring. Um, and so I am requesting that we extend their contract um, by one year. Um, as you will see in the backup documentation that the only change to the contracts is the extension of a year. Um, the benefits, which they do not receive, um, remains that way. Um, so they will continue to pay their own benefits and compensation stays the same. Um, um, so the only change is instead of it expiring at the end of this school year, it will be the end of next school year, so 2019. Okay, thank you. Is there any board discussion? Are there any speakers? No speakers to this item. No discussion? Um, I'll entertain I actually a had a question with regards to that. Um, so you said within a few months, where are we at in line of sight or foresight of when things will be settled with PBFT? So we will have mediation occur March 2nd. Um, we do not know when, um, what will happen on that date, nor if we will be certified for fact finding. Um, if we can't, only the mediator can decide when we go up to fact finding. Um, once that occurs, then um, there's a timeline of approximately 50 days um, if we don't have any waivers of, um, of timelines. Um, but we are not the deciding factor. Um, neither PVFT or us are the deciding factor of when we're certified for fact finding. Only the neutral mediator will decide if he is hit a crossroads. 
Okay, it's just in my thought and opinion in this is that I just think that the timing is off if we can't even have that settled, which was a non-go negotiation from the prior year. So that's where I stand in my position on this. Um, if I may, the, the difference between the two is that um, they cannot work a day after their contract expires, um, and, but that is the reason why we have absolutely no changes to their, um, to their um, contract except for the one year. Are there any other comments? Well, uh, yes, uh, a question. What um, I'm uh, trying to see what relationship one has to do with the other. The um, the uh, contract for the superintendents or the assistant superintendents should uh, go on anyway. Um, what? Why? You know, I you know I got the feeling that you want to wait for one for the other. Why? Well, as I stated, it, it's we still have that negotiation from a prior contract year that's up in the air and not even resolved. And I just don't think it's good management practices that we're moving forward with management when we're not even, you know, resolving issues with our working teachers in the I, classrooms. I can see that, but 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 we still have to run the school district. We uh, still need uh, management, and we're not increasing the salaries out of the budget as far as I understand. So um, I, don't, I don't think that we can wait to um, wait on all of the projects that we have to be able to do in the school district for the, the, um, the impasse um, work could go on for five or six months, as I understand, isn't that right? I'm hearing what you're saying, and I have a different position and take on this, uh -huh. and I'm just saying, that the teachers are the front line of this school district. You know, we're in the business of educating the youth in this community, and they're the front line of that. So that, I think, needs to be resolved before we move forward with other contracts with management at okay. this point. Again, I've stated my position. We, okay, let's that's fine. Free to move on. That's fine. Are you done? That's fine. Anybody else? Uh, I'm in full support of extending contracts for assistant superintendents are doing a very good job. I don't want to risk losing them, and um, there's no reason to move forward with a budget-neutral item which um, extends their working conditions for an extra year. We need to do it, and it's the right thing to do at this time. Anybody else? Okay. Um, thank you for the board comments. I also support moving forward with extending the contracts. Uh, if this doesn't happen now, we run the very real risk that we will lose our, assist our assistant superintendents and honestly, we just can't function um, without that cabinet level support, which are out at the site supporting our sites and our principals and our teachers um, every day as long as well as our superintendent. So without that, Yes, the teachers will be in the classroom, but the support that they need to get their job done will not be there. And I also believe that our assistant superintendents have done a fantastic job, and we are seeing results. So with that, I will call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes 610. Um, Leslie, if I can... If I may, I, I, yes, no, no, I just want to compliment us, compliment us for being able to have a, um, a, uh, a discussion. Uh, you, you know, I think this is healthy and I think this is, this, uh, need, needs to, needs to get done more and more. So I, I, uh, value your view, uh, or others views. I may not agree with it, but, it, but I think it's healthy for us to be able to talk, talk in the open session with it. Oh. Trustee DeRose, um, I also want to say I'm, I, I agree with you. I think we need, we need to continue the work of the, of the district as we work with our teachers. Um, as, I'm, as I reviewed this last night, though, the, the comment that kept coming into my head was, are we sure about Mark Brewer? Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Way to lighten it up, Trustee Ursino. Um, <laughs> my pleasure. So Dr. Rodriguez just in... Dr. Rodriguez just informed me that I didn't call for a first and a second, which I thought I did. Yes, we're going to redo. To make vote. a motion to extend the assistant superintendent contracts. Okay. And do I have a second? I'll second. Okay.
Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Motion motion passes six one zero. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So item five point one as approval of, of the minutes for our February twenty first board meeting. And we'd like to move approval. I'll I'll second. Here. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Those abstaining? Abstain. Five zero two. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, item six is our high school board representatives report. Do we have high school students here to give us a report this evening? Okay, and I know Perla is here and I'm trying to find her on the agenda. She could, if she would like to give a report, I can um, have you give a report here. Um, well, I, I emailed the student representatives, and they oh. told me they were going to come, but I don't know. Homework got yeah. in the way again. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Have you got anything you would like to say? No pressure. Well, we're just at Watsonville High School. I go to Watsonville High School. Hi. Um, well, we're just um, getting ready for prom. We're starting to plan a little bit early and um, we're also getting ready for our freshmen to uh, get more information about their small learning academy communities the academies um, and yeah and we've been talking a lot about also about raising school safety awareness at Watson Mill High School and the group of students uh, came together to discuss the subject which has been uh, pretty healthy at the school and yeah, I think that's about it. Okay, um, we're at um, item 7.0, and this is a public hearing. So I'll close the regular meeting and open the public hearing. And this is a report on Lynn Scott Charter School, and that's by Principal Julie Wiley. Good evening. My name is Julie Wiley. Thank you for having us here to talk about Lynn Scott's charter renewal. You have no idea how happy I am to hand this off to you after all of the, <laughs> all of the time it has taken to put it together. Um, I would like to ask uh, staff and parents of Lynn Scott students to stand and just acknowledge that they came. They're kind of my posse, so I brought them along with me this evening. and They're here to <laughs> provide me with some moral support. With this charter renewal, Lynn Scott Charter School marks nearly a quarter of a century as a school dedicated to parent participation and shared decision making in the education of their students. Although times change and adjustments must be made to our program, the Lynn Scott community continues to believe that experiential learning and parent involvement ensure the academic success of all of our students. The many pieces and parts of this charter document are required for you, our authorizer, to review and approve. But the essence of who we are as a community is reflected in our mission statement. We have a slideshow. I'm just really keeping my fingers crossed and hoping, because this is like magic. I thought I was going to have to bring my own computer and plug in a flash drive and, ah, darn it. Really? That's amazing. We got to get somebody like that at our school. Someone <laughs> who can make that happen. <laughs> oh, I do have it on a flash drive. It's on Keynote. Will that play Keynote?
I have to give props to my son-in-law who figured out how to get the audio into the pictures. If you don't have a son-in-law, I highly recommend them. They really come in handy for lots of things. <laughs> Upside down. So as I said um, earlier, there, have, there are some additions to the document, which is why it's so much longer than the one you saw five years ago. There are affirmations and declaration statements that are now um, supposed to be part of a charter petition. We also had to include comparison school data, SBAC data, and um, the dashboard report for Linscott Charter School, as well as a copy of the LCAP report, which the board already had a copy of. Um, significant changes that we've made at Linscott in terms of policy changes in the last five years, changes to our admission policy to make sure that we were um, in compliance with new regulations that had been passed. Parent participation policies have had to change as a result of some new legislation and some rulings in court, and we've also um, revised our discipline policy. So I'm going to let you just read that, and <laughs> you can... Ask me questions now if you want to read it over and you would like to send me an email or call, pick up the phone and call me. I'm, I'm happy to, to field those questions. Thank you. So we don't have any public comments for this item, so I want to bring it back to the board. Willie? Thank you. Um, 
On our on our uh, tour of the facilities, um, when we got to Linscott, it uh, seemed like the the uh, little plot of land that Linscott has was completely filled with portables and on and on. Um, is there a plan that that we are aware of that would um, build up or build out or build something to help relieve it? It looks like it's really overcrowded, and and the uh, housing unit on Riverside that just opened. I'm not sure if it's is, are, are are those children coming to will will be coming to Linscott? Well, because it's a charter school, we don't have an attendance area like right. other schools in the district. So those students are certainly um, welcome and able to submit an application during our open application period, which is happening right now. But classrooms are filled by lottery. By law, that's the way they ha classrooms are ha have to be open spots and classrooms have to be filled. So yes, some of those children might end up going right. to school there. We are, are we are pr we are pretty um, cozy. What is the um, what is the size of your school now? What is the attendance? Of about two hundred and seventy six students currently enrolled kindergarten through eighth grade. We have one class per grade level, with the exception of an intentional multi grade class that has seven first graders, seven second graders, and seven third graders in it. And a number of years ago, we added an extra kindergarten class to help with the budget crisis that the school was in. And so we have one grade level that has two classes. I, I refer to it as the spot where the snake swallowed the rat. You know how it gets really bulgy. So right now, those kids are in the sixth grade. They will go on and graduate in the, uh, from the eighth grade. And then the plan is to go back to that one discrete grade level. Thank at you. that class. So we have about 276 kids right now. So oh, I would, I would um, take it that, uh, that you're pretty well filled to capacity? Yes, we are. Um, do you have a waiting list for the, for the school? We do. So well, how do you anticipate full, uh, fill, um, meeting, the needs of the, meeting the needs of the school? Well, the, the, the charter calls for one grade, one class per grade level. So that's all we have room to house, 22 students kindergarten through third grade per class and 30 students fourth grade through eighth grade per class. If we have more students than that who apply, then we have the lottery. The lottery establishes who is who gets openings in those classes and then a wait list is established. If you're asking, can we open more classrooms to let in those people who are on the wait list? I don't think that that's part of the, of the plan. I don't think that's part of our site management team's plan to expand, um, f partly for space, partly for money, partly because I would run screaming from the room probably if they asked us to do that. Um, Radcliffe, Radcliffe School has a, a very wonderful uh, two-story building. Mm -hmm. Have, have, have you thought about something like that? Yeah, we had um, a company come in a number of years ago to give us an estimate on the cost of putting up a building such as that on the, on the property. We don't have a cafeteria. We don't have a multi-purpose room. We're, we're short on a lot of things like that. And the cost was going to be pretty prohibitive. So that's, that's what's holding us up at this point is um, the cost of, the, of a project like that. Lastly, um, have, have uh, you thought about using Watsonville High School's fields, which are right next door to you? We do. That's where our PE program takes place for our upper grades. Good. Yes. And once a week, our uh, PE, once a week, Mark, once a month, once a week, our 6th, um, 7th, and 8th graders go to the uh, rec center just down the street over on U Center, sorry. Um, over okay. by the police department, right. and they use the gym there. What about what about the Watsonville High School swimming pool? I would love to use the Watsonville High School swimming pool. Could you make that happen for us? Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Nothing would make that. me happier. If we we have tried before, and we haven't been able to put the pieces together. So that would be that would be awesome. We would love to have like an exploratory class. Pardon me. Okay. Well, we'll see what see what can happen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, facilities, I I gather, would be the number one number one need for Lynn Scott. Would that would be yeah that would be 
I would agree with you. Facilities, um, it, it's definitely an issue. It's an ongoing issue. It's an, it's an old building. It's a lovely building, but it's an old building. And the older the building gets, the more things that need to be done and the more, um, the, the more issues we have to, to confront windows. Last year, it was rats. That seems to have solved itself, thank goodness. Um, but yeah, the, the facility is old, and so it's going right. it, to take some attention. So the, the uh, youngsters that live around Linscott School, if, if they don't attend Linscott, I understand they have to go to McQuitty School. If that's their school of attendance, I'm not exactly sure where the boundaries I, are. I believe McQuitty's there. Some of our students school. are in the Ratcliffe attend. Or you're asking about the kids in the community yeah. that live closest to the school. I believe it is McQuitty. Right. Okay. 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 Could Thank be Radcliffe. I'm not sure where the lines are. Like right. I said. Thank you, Willie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other one? Who else has comments or questions? Pam. Hi, thanks for being here, and thanks to all the great parents that came to support tonight. And teachers. And Many teachers, of them are teachers, wonderful. too. Wonderful. Um, so in the past, when we've had charter school renewals come up, we typically get a dashboard from you that kind of says, here's how many kids, mm -hmm. and then some data on achievement and how things are going in that way. In this presentation, I don't see that, and it seems to be buried in a report. That in the I'm document, having. at the back, there are appendices, and the appendices right. um, have the dashboard data from the state. They also have... Well, so, the, in, so what I'm asking you now yes. is, I can't... I mean, I've read your report. But right. For everybody here and for everybody on camera, can you just summarize for us... Because I know Lynn Scott does very well typically, but I'm looking at, there's some information in here from 2011, 2012, it's not current. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking at an analysis of comparison schools, and it looks like in ELA and math, in ELA you've got 39.9% of students meeting grade averages. Are you looking exceeding, at meeting or exceeding standards? Are you looking on page eight? I am. Let's make sure we're looking at the same. And spot. then in math, thirty percent. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Are you talking in, for two thousand seventeen? Yeah. Yes. So school wide, thirty just under forty percent um, are meeting the mark in ELA and thirty point twenty five percent in math. So I'm um, I'm wondering what what are you using to like. What, are you using the same systems that we're using district-wide, or do you have your own ideas for how to improve those, those so scores we have or our that own, data? We have our own curriculum because we're an independent, semi-independent charter school. We, um, ha our board has the right to make a decision about what curriculum they're going to use. And so four years ago, we... Um, purchased a new English language arts program. We purchased a new ELD program. We purchased a new math program two years ago um, and made sure that it was continuous from kindergarten through eighth grade, that it was the same program, the same publisher, so that we were using the same language, having the same conversations at each grade level about what kids needed to know and how they were going to figure out what those were. And so we do some of the same things just because those are our standard good practices, but we do have different curriculum depending upon what our staff and what our board decide to adopt. So in the last two years, have you noted any improvements to your kids' achievement, or we like have, how's it going with the new curriculum? Yeah, we have pockets of improvement. This is the f only the second year that the new Math and Focus program, the Singapore Math that we purchased, has been used in the primary grades. We, we, imp we implemented it a year earlier in the middle school, and it's very challenging, and the middle school teachers and the middle school kids were pulling their hair out a lot because it was much, it's much more challenging than the one we were using. Now, after the second year, we're starting to see kids understanding more complicated mathematical processes at a, a more foundational level, and the primary teachers are really excited about the improvement that they see. Was that, is that your how question? You, well, there's a lot of questions. Okay. So how are you measuring that improvement? So we have these SBAC scores. We also have the STAR reading and math assessments that the district also uses that students take online and teachers administer those at least three times a year, usually beginning, middle, and end to sort of show growth over time. Um, we have 
different kinds of teacher created assessments that teachers give to um, to look at student achievement. We also use running record in the primary grades where teachers do individual reading assessments with students to see what their fluency is like, what their error rate is like, things like that. That's great. And um, Susan, do you have staff that collaborates with Lynn Scott? In terms of the map, looking at map stuff, or they're just completely doing that on their own? So yeah, that's what I thought. No. I thought you just said you're using maps. No, we use oh we use the star Sorry. math and reading assessment. I thought you said map. No, the map okay. is the NWEA, which yeah. we Um, privileges, things mm -hmm. like that. But, but as far as, you know, the, the legal part of being a public school, the number of days that you're in school, um, making days, sure that we follow them. Common Core, all that's the same. Okay, so so the, that's the same in all charts. I mean, I, didn't, I wasn't sure if you're independent, you know, because I figured, because I know that the charter schools that we have that are not independent, obviously they work more in that way. But okay, so I, I understand <laughs> better now the difference I mean the differences that are not different <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay anyone else Kim okay. yeah I just you know I'm just looking at your data and it you you took a, a pretty significant drop from 2016 to 2017 what do you attribute that to um, I think part of it's the math curriculum. I think that the difficulty level of this particular, um, of the curriculum is not, it, it hasn't flowed very well from one grade to the next because we haven't had it in place K-8 for very long. We also, that group of kids that we, where the snake swallowed the rat, where the big, the big bump of kids in, they have not tested well since they started testing in third grade and nobody really knows why. We look at individual students who should be, you know, knocking it out of the park and they're not doing well on the standardized test and we're not, like I said, we're not really sure why. We don't know why that's, that's happening that way. Um, but it has been consistent since they started testing in the third grade. And that's really the only grade level where we've seen a drop. Everybody else has stayed pretty, pretty steady or grown significantly in the achievement on this test. I see you struggle with your English language learners um, like the rest of the district. Mm -hmm. uh, do you provide any special uh, intervention for that group of kids? We do have an ELD um, instructor who's part-time on campus, a credentialed teacher. She provides most ELD on a pull-out basis, but she does push in and support students in, classroom as, in the classroom as well. We also added to her contract time this year an hour and a half homework session after school twice a week so that she would be available to help um, students who are English language learners complete their homework or understand what it was that they wanted to do. So it will be interesting for us to see when the new LPAC data comes out. It'll be interesting for us to see if that's made a significant difference in those student scores. That's great. I know parents are very um, pleased with your school, your curriculum, and the way it's run. And um, in the past, when I've looked at data side by side by side with the rest of the district schools, you've always ranked very high. So. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's a credit to them. Yeah, congratulations. They are a pretty everybody. incredible teaching staff. Yeah, and, and I apologize for my hard questions, no, but no. that's my job up no, here, right? Absolutely. So, absolutely. Uh, we want to make sure that. Nothing you know, wrong with hard questions. And I think next time you present, it would be good to have, like, at a glance, a dashboard for the board and for the public so that we could see very clearly. So, like, a, clear, a more clear summary? Yeah. Looking that's specifically good. at data? Um, data could be one of it, just okay. everything. Okay. 
how many VAPA classes, music. I mean, just sort of at a glance, like the rather things than, that you want to brag about at the school. Rather and then than the data embedded. embedded. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I do have a couple questions for you. Um, what's your um, suspension and expulsion rates? Well, let me see. <laughs> when we st when I started as the uh, admin director principal, this is my fourth year. So when I started four years ago, we had, um, I think, I want to say in my first year, we had one expulsion. It was for a weapon that was on campus, and we had probably, I'd have to go back and look at the actual numbers, but I want to say probably eight or nine suspensions, and they tended to be repeat offenders. Um, last year we had no expulsions. So far this year we have had no expulsions. And we've had, I believe it was three, maybe four suspensions. I think four, three of them were the same student. Yeah, and what kind of interventions are in place to assist the students? When they're, in, when they're having behavioral issues? Right. Yeah. So we have, um, we always have meetings with parents. We have a Lynn Scott Community Curriculum, which is our uh, discipline program, which is based on four, um, four characteristics, respect, responsibility, resourcefulness, and responsiveness. And so we have a login system at school where if a student breaks one of those agreements, a teacher will say, you know, you need to log in. And then it will give an opportunity for a conversation to take place about the choice that, that was made. So there's a lot of support within this, that system because it gives kids an opportunity to make a different decision the next time around. We also have um, what we call a Reflective Friday with um, Mark Damiani, who is our PE instructor, who meets on Friday afternoons for kids who've had a certain number of logins and it's not for punishment, it's an opportunity for them to talk about what the choice was that they made, why it was wrong, and how it negatively impacted their community, and then they have a conversation about what they can do to pay the community back. So it might be some kind of community service, it might be an apology for something that they did that they, that they need to make right. Um, we put behavior contracts in place if we need to. We often have a buddy up system where an, a student might act as a, a support for a, a friend if they're having a difficult time maintaining themselves in a certain um, environment or in a certain um, venue on the playground. So we try to um, provide as much support both to students and parents when a kid is struggling as we can before we go to something that's more hardcore. Thank you. And we, we've seen an increase in the need for mental health services. Do you offer any social, uh, emotional counselors at your sites? Are they available? They are not. We have, um, we do refer kids regularly to uh, different um, counseling com areas in the community, one of them being the school district one. Um, we do have a school psychologist that we contract with PVUSD for SELPA services, and she is, or he or she, whoever that happens to be, um, has been really gracious about making themselves available to help with those issues. Um, f most of the time we end up counseling parents and referring them to go to someone in the community that we know is, um, is reputable and that we've had other parents come back with a good report from. All right, so is it not necessarily a school priority to have a social emotional counselor is it just it's a matter of money it's a matter of money yeah okay thank you mm -hmm. okay so i am going to close this public hearing and open our regular meeting with item 8.0 non-agenda items and we doesn't look like we have any speakers for that item so we're gonna move right along with employee organization comments and we're gonna there's one. There's one. I'm sorry. That's okay, I didn't know. Mr. Rich Detterman, will you approach the podium? Good evening, Superintendent Rodriguez and board members. Uh, my name is Rich Detterman. I currently am the principal at Mar Vista. 
Almost 40 years ago, I stepped into Pajaro Valley for the very first time. I'm going to try not to be emotional. Um, and I taught um, a program called Opportunity School. It was on the Rolling Hills campus. And I actually thought it was my very first teaching assignment. And I thought it was a, gift, I thought it was a program for the gifted and not realizing because the description was small class size, um, individualized instruction, and I thought, wow, this is, this is great. And um, realized, and it was a gifted program, um, and they, this was uh, mainly for boys who got kicked out of the regular junior high schools in uh, Pajaro Valley. And it was an unbelievable, wonderful experience. And now here, almost 40 years later, um, I turn in my retirement paper this morning, and I kind of thought, <clears throat> you know, when you turn in the papers, I thought balloons were going to fall down, and then Tony would be out with a, a whistle, and, but um, I, just wanted, I just wanted to come and spend the, the, a little bit of time to say thank you for the, to the board. Um, some of you have been here almost, Willie, almost the whole time I've been here. Um, and you have led us through some really difficult times. Um, I know that we'd all like to have get paid more money, um, but we know that um, you lead us wisely, um, and it's not easy decisions to make. And I remember a few years ago when the district had to cut millions of dollars from the budget. And that was, that was brutal. But I actually just wanted to say thank you all for your time. Um, it's not the big paycheck at the end of the month. Um, and um, I think people who spend time getting to know the district um, realize what a special group of people this is. Um, and we're all this. We're all part of this family. I've known Susan since my days at, on the Rolling Hills campus. Um, and um, you people here, you gave me the opportunity to be a principal of Mar Vista. And every day, I don't take it for granted, um, I have 464 children that I get to see every day and that you had that trust in me. Um, and I, look, I, I don't look at that, I do not take that for granted at all. Um, gone through some incredibly great times, some sad times, and I'd like to thank my reps from my area for your support. Last year when we went through the um, situation with a, a young man who made some very bad choices, and you, call, you took time out to call me to see how I was doing. Um, and um, that was very special. And I just, just wanted to say thank you. I, you know, when I was thinking about not doing this anymore, and I thought, well, what am I, what am I going to miss the most? And it's the journey that I'm going to miss. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get off the train, and the train's going to keep going, and I'm going to wave, and... Michelle will wave back, um, and, and it will keep going. Um, I, and I'm going to miss that. I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to miss the people I've grown up with. When I started this, you know, I was 22 years old, um, and um, I bumped into a young man who was in my very first class that I taught at Opportunity School. And I, and I said, Jose, how old are you now? And he said, I'm 54. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, holy smokes, I've gone from 54 to age four in my lifetime. Not very many people can say that in their career. <laughs> um, and this is, not, this is not a job. This, this is a career. And... Um, and to say, if you had the same thing, if you could do it over again, would you do that over again? Absolutely. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Um, and in my last thing I want to say, I just want to thank Chona. She came to the Mar Vista staff because we were thinking about 
the process for the next principal. And she asked me in front of my colleagues about, it must have been a half dozen times, a dozen times. Well, I'm still trying to talk Rich out of not retiring. And that made me feel really, really very special. So there was no real purpose of, of what I'm doing up here, but just to say thank you. Um, you know, the very first year that I taught in Pajaro, three minutes. This is like the Academy Awards, you know, when you get the Academy Awards. No, <laughs> the music starts playing. I, I got 40 years here. But anyway, <laughs> I, I just wanted to say thank you all very, very much. All right, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Detterman, if I may, come back to the podium for a minute. After 40 years, you deserve it. <laughs> I want to thank you um, in particular. Um, I, um, I'm a mom of two kids, one's 20 and one's 16. And um, I don't know why or how, but it seems like I was always at the intersection driving a kid to daycare, even when they were babies, you know, um, at that intersection where Rio Del Mar, where the bridge over the highway to Rio Del Mar. And um, every time I was there, you were, the kids at Aptos Junior High were outside, like they, they were leaving campus essentially, and you were out there always. And I watched you treat those kids with so much love and respect. And it's one of the things that I talk to Michelle a lot because that doesn't happen sometimes at other campuses. Kids are treated sort of like they're criminals, like what are you doing kind of by our staff. And I really um, want to thank you for treating those kids like they were your own kids because I could see it clearly. And I, didn't, I wasn't even connected yet to the district, but I would watch you every day out there on the corner by Piggy's Market, mm -hmm. helping those kids get safely to and from campus morning and, and uh, afternoon. And um, the counseling support, and, the, and really you were one of the administrators at that school, even though you were in your counseling role, that you provided to Aptos Junior High for all those years was um, amazing. And I, and I know that staff missed you when you went to Mar Vista, but Mar Vista really benefited from your leadership there, and you did a great job. Oh, thank you. And took that school through a very difficult time. Great. Thank you. Yeah. But thank you for everything. Just, just, just one final note. And this tells me I, it's, I'm getting older. I went into the third grade class. I have some four girls that just help me all the time. They're my go-to girls. And so I went in the classroom, and I told the girls, would you grab your tablet and a pencil and meet me in the cafeteria? <laughs> so I go into the cafeteria, and they're all there with their Chromebooks. And they said, Mr. D, why did we need our pencil? <laughs> so, <laughs> then I knew it was time to, to go on. <laughs> well, congratulations. Congratulations. I hope you'll come back and do some consulting with us, Mr. Detterman. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So moving on. So item 9.0, employee organization comments, and we're going to get started with PBFT. Thank you, Francisco Rodriguez uh, with Pajaro Valley Fer Federation of Teachers. Um, and congratulations to uh, Mr. Detterman. Yeah, yeah, when um, we're not there, it's a good sign. Um, so I, I just wanted to remind the board of a couple things. Um, uh, the first one is August uh, 23rd, uh, 2017. Uh, at that time, a uh, request came to you to create uh, an additional management position at a cost of $138,000. Um, this is uh, ongoing monies, right? Because it's, it's going to cost. Um, uh, you made a wise decision in not creating that position, I, I, I believe. Um, however, uh, today on consent agenda, under items 12.3, 12.4, and 12.5, uh, you are being asked to approve a memorandum of understanding with the 
uh, parent uh, education uh, nursery schools in the Santa Cruz adult education service area. Um, the MOU, uh, well, we have a couple problems with the MOU, several problems. Uh, the MOU requires the um, organizations to uh, pay for all expenses, everything. And in, in fact, it plainly states that this will not cost the district any money. And in addition, there is uh, an item there that um, states, uh, item number six of each contract, that states that uh, the organizations will not require or allow the teachers to fundraise. And I'm not sure if you're aware of the situation with the, um, th they call them the PENS for short, uh, in the Santa Cruz service area, but um, they uh, have a hard time uh, raising uh, funds. And we, we, we have a number of concerns because uh, I mean, obviously, you have $138,000 of ongoing monies uh, that can very well uh, be used to support these programs and provide the services to those families in the Santa Cruz service area. Uh, you also are treating our members in the Santa Cruz service area very differently than everybody else in the district. As you're probably aware, many of our teachers uh, support fundraising and participate in fundraising and uh, do everything that they can to uh, help programs. Our opposition when we brought this issue up was that teachers were being not only required to uh, fundraise for their or led to believe that they had to fundraise for their salaries, uh, to pay for their salaries and benefits. Um, but the actual invoices to the organizations were being sent to these teachers. And that was our objection. Not that the teachers not be allowed to fundraise. Our, all teachers help fundraise and, and create programs. So we have some real concerns with that because if you approve this MOU, I believe my understanding is only one of those organizations has the funds to survive for maybe two years or so. The others are going to fold. And um, as from our experience with your MOU with Santa Cruz City Schools, which we believe you are not following, that means that those teachers that have greater seniority than many of the teachers in the Watsonville area will be coming into Watsonville area or will have rights. That whole MOU that you signed was to avoid these types of problems. So rather than approving this MOU at this time, I would recommend the following. Number one, that you consider supporting the PENS at least for two or three years until they are able to fundraise or have a plan um, that, that will uh, create uh, or, or allow them to be financially stable. Uh, number two, that you review the terms of the MOU with Santa Cruz City Schools regarding the integration of the adult education programs. And number three, that you remove item number six from the MOU and we're fine with the organizations not requiring teachers to fundraise, but the or allow piece is uh, very different. So thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Okay, now moving on to item 9.2, CSEA. Okay, how about PAVAM, CWA? So moving on to item 10.0, action items. 10.1, um, resolution of state funding. 
and this report will be done by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. <laughs> No, I'm Dr. Michelle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think the last name. <laughs> um, so we, we are putting forth, um, so originally several months ago, CB, um, CSBA asked us to um, look at um, a resolution calling for fair, full and fair funding of the ca for California public schools. Um, we, um, we looked at it. We did alter it a bit in order to acknowledge a couple of things. One, um, both the, the state average for English learners and the state average for students that live in poverty is much higher for us. Um, and so we put that information in there. Um, we also put in information recognizing um, the fact that our cost of living here in Santa Cruz County is significantly higher um, than many of the others. Um, they did put out a call for other school districts um, to do it yet again. Um, and um, we were already planning on doing this. We will be the first one within um, the county to do this resolution. We are recognizing two things. One, we do have, and we noted it in here, we do recognize that they, the governor did put forth the closure of the gap, of the LCFF gap, so that, you know, he gave us our last 2%. Um, so that is recognized in here. Um, and then we also recognize the fact that um, the Senate just um, put forth a proposal in order to raise the bar even higher. However, I, I do want to note that even though that did happen, um, we still are ranked um, 45th nationally. Um, so we did go from 49th um, to 45th, um, but we still believe that we do not have the funding, understanding the cost, the rising costs that are happening in order to be able to significantly um, do the things that we need to do, and um, more than anything to retain and um, and be able to pay for programs. So as we've stated before, our LCFF is back up to where it was in 2008, so our funding is back up there. However, the main caveat to that is PERS and STIRS have gone up dramatically and will continue to go up dramatically, as well as health and welfare transportation costs have skyrocketed as well, and we have the largest fleet in all of Central California. And then special education have costs have gone up as well. We are high. We are at 14% of special education versus the the state average of nine to 10%. Um, and so because of that, we encourage you to endorse this resolution um, so that we may um, put it forth and do help do some work at the state and federal level. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any speakers to this item. I will start on the side of the room. Um, any comments from board? Questions? Hey, Willie. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, um, is there any emphasis on receiving ongoing money versus one-time money? You know, if, if, if the state says, yeah, there's more money, but it's going to be for special ed, I mean, it all sounds like we're going to get a lot more money, but it can't be used for salaries or whatever. Is there? So, so yes. So the resolution specifically speaks to LCFF entitlements, which includes three categories. So it does include the base, which can be used for anything and everything. Um, we do receive significant concentration and supplemental funds, but it would include all three categories. Um, you know, I think we would also like to look at revamping in general um, how education is funded. Um, however, at this point, what we're trying to do is just work within the system and have the system recognize that um, we need more funding in order to be able to do the work that we need to do. No, but you're, you're um, I'm uh, trying to understand what you were okay. saying about having the three um, categories. Okay. So, but, so is that ongoing? So that's what entitlement would be. Entitlement would be ongoing funds so that we would know that year after year we would have those funds. But they have to be spent on certain things? Um, so the base can be spent on anything. Generally, it's, it's spent on staff, um, but it can be spent on anything. Okay, so, but, then, but then if we wanted to uh, use money for um, uh, CET mm -hmm. or CTE or mm -hmm. CET, whatever, mm -hmm. So what 
category would that come out of? Anything or? Well, because of the the population that we serve, and we serve a lot of fragile student populations, we're actually re-looking at re, which is, I know this is all very technical, but we're looking at re redefining the base, and that would mean that that would allow us to use more of our supplemental and concentration funds for certain programs. Um, it really, at this point, it depends on the school in which it is. Most of our schools, um, because of their the level of students that live in poverty and English learning we can use all three categories for programs. Okay. So was that in the resolution somehow? I Yes, so it's um, it's in there in terms of the LCFF, so it where it says recognizes the recent proposal um, to fully fund the entitlement and the recent Senate proposal. The state funding for K-12 schools is only recently returned to the levels, and it speaks to us needing, um, if you go down to fourth from the bottom, um, it talks about a, a group that was commissioned that said that in order for us be fully funded, we would need $17 billion annually more to go towards education. Also, if you look at the second to bottom, it speaks to we only receive $1,961 per student. Nationally, it's 3462 So you can see that we, the, we're half of the national average. And so that's what we're encouraging them to do is to ensure that by the end, so what we're asking them to do is to, by year 2020, um, to be at that national average, and by 2025 to be equal or above the national average. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Kim? Um, you know, just for the public's sake, I, if, if it's okay, I'd like to read a couple of these whereases because I think they're really important. Um, so we are, I'll just say these comments first. They, we are up to um, 2008 funding standards. It is now 2017, and we, as you've said, we've had incredible rising costs, not to mention that this is one of the highest um, cost of living places on the face of the planet. So um, unfortunately, because we have the sixth largest economy in the world and the largest GDP of any state in the nation, and whereas um, despite our leadership in global economy, the state falls in the nation's bottom quintile on nearly every measure of public K through 12 school funding and school staffing, and whereas California ranks 45th nationally in the percentage of taxable income spent on education, 41st in per pupil funding, and 45th in pupil teacher ratios, and 48th in pupil staff ratios, 48th. Whereas uh, the PVUSD Board of Trustees recognizes the recent proposal to fully fund local control funding formula, um, back up to um, levels predating the Great Recession of 2007, whereas K through 12 school funding has not substantially increased on an inflation-adjusted basis for more than a decade, whereas the modest revenue increases since the implementation of LCFF have been eroded by rapidly increasing costs for health care, pensions, transportation, special ed, and utilities, whereas 58% of California's public school students are eligible for free and reduced lunch, uh, yeah, and yet the Pajaro Valley District serves 78% of students living in poverty, whereas 23% of California students are English learners, more than twice the national average. We serve 68% here in Pajaro Valley. Whereas California's investment in public schools is out of alignment with its wealth, its ambition, and its demographics and the demands of a 21st century education. Whereas California funds schools at roughly $1,961 per student less than the national average, which translates into approximately $3,462 per student when adjusted for California being a high-cost state. And I'm not sure, I think it's probably higher than that given our Santa Cruz County cost of living. It goes on and on and on, but I am in full support of this resolution. I think we need to send a very clear message to the state that we need to put more resources towards education so that we can pay teachers and staff a living wage. And with that, I'll make a motion to support this resolution. If there are no more comments. I am looking for a second. All those in favor? 
Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 601. Right? Right. Okay. Item 10.2, quarterly board study session meetings. Um, so for this item, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> you want me to go? Superintendent. Okay, great. So at the last board meeting, there was a request to have regularly scheduled board meetings, um, special board study sessions, so that we could really dive into data and really dive into systems and supports. Um, and so what um, staff and I did is we looked at the months in which we only have one board meeting, and we looked at um, scheduling three board meetings um, basically up until November, the end of November, so that we could discuss it. So these are just proposed dates and topics. Of course, um, these can be changed, but this is what we heard um, from you. So we had already discussed and talked about April 11th um, being a in regards of the K-12 academic data. Um, and so we had a pretty large discussion about that um, this past time. But what we do is we would be able to spend um, three hours really diving into everything from um, our early literacy data to our AP and SAT and ACT data. Um, we are recommending July 11th, 2018 to really have a big discussion, um, budget discussion that would allow all board members to have full information prior to um, looking at the new budget. Um, and so we wanted, we are suggesting that date. And then on November 28th, um, which I understand is fairly far away, but the, rec the reason why is we're trying to find one where we only have one board meeting, um, we would do what um, Trustee Ojiro was asking and really look at student services and social emotional supports that are happening throughout the city and how nonprofits are working um, together um, in a synergistic fashion in order to be able to support our students. Um, so these are just proposed um, dates and times, but I'd like to um, open it up for discussion so that everyone is aware of the dates and then um, we can move staff forward to um, fulfilling these dates. Thank you, Michelle. So we don't have any speakers to this item. Any board comments? Don't mean uh, she wants to go. Just that I'm in full okay. support. I think this is a great idea to have these study sessions, and thank you for putting it together. Me too. How about you, Willie? Yes. Um, one of the one of the things that I've learned about the superintendent um, is um, <laughs> is when you say something, she writes it down, and it happens. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's a and it's a and it's a wonderful attribute. But I have to watch up what I say. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for for listening and responding. That that's wonderful. Um, and and at the last board meeting that I I mentioned that what we need is a special meeting to talk about the safety aspects and trying to trying to trying to bring everybody together. And uh, thank you for listening and writing it down. I gotta watch out what you say. It's, thank you. Since there's no board comments, um, I am looking for a motion. And a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Six zero one. Okay. Item 10.3, first reading, alternative calendars option by PVFT. And report will be done by Dr. Cho Nekalin. Uh, PVFT President Francisco Rodriguez, we are going to try something new and co-present something. We promise not to fight okay. or argue. <laughs> but there is no Michael Jackson song to go with our presentation. <laughs> We're sorry. Um, Vice President Orozco, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, this is the calendar update, part two.
So we're just continuing next steps with regard to the calendar. Um, principals are continuing to obtain feedback from parent groups um, on the proposals. And within 10 days of the January of our January 12, 24th board meeting, um, PVFT did present a demand to bargain per Article 5 of the contract. And tonight we're going to present their alternative calendar. And from there, um, PVFT will present both calendar options to their bargaining unit members for review and a vote. Mm -hmm. And then the proposed calendars are subject to ratification by PVFT and board approval. An update will be presented with a summary of the parent and community input as well as the union vote results and a subsequent meeting for final consideration by the governing board of trustees. And our agenda tonight is just to give you a quick overview of the district calendar committee a recommendation from the January 24th board meeting. And then we're going to present the differences between the, the PVFT alternative as well as the district calendar committee recommendations for 2018-19, 2019-20. And I'm saving the, the hard one for um, Mr. Rodriguez to present for 2020 to 2021. So um, this is the from the district calendar committee. Um, quick overview, it was at 87 days for first semester. The start date would be August 16th um, and end would be uh, December 22nd, 2017. Second semester is 93 days um, and it was longer to accommodate state testing. Start date would be uh, January 17th, 2018 and um, end date would be 6 8 18. <coughs> Um, the 2018 to 19 calendar, first semester is 87 school days, start date August 15th, end date will be December 20th, second semester is 93 days, uh, start date uh, 115, uh, 19, and end date is 6 7 19. Um, the the 1920 calendar is uh, start date would be 8 14, end date would be uh, 12 19. And second semester is start date is 114, end date is 6520. And then the last um, of the, the three calendars is um, would be for 2020 to 2021. Start date is 812, uh, 2020. End date would be uh, 1218, 2020 for first semester for 87 days. Second semester is 93 days. Start date would be January 13th, 2021. And end date would be uh, June 4th, 2021. I'm gonna do the easy ones um, with regard to um, the PVFT alternate calendar. Uh, for 2018 to 2019, um, there's only really one change, and um, PVFT's alternate calendar moves the elementary school parent conferences from the week of November 26th to the week of November, tw uh, November 5th. Um, we've had a lot of parents that agree with that and shared with us that they would like the parent conference days um, a little bit earlier, um, and this was um, something that the principals were telling us from the input that they've gathered. So that we have parents in support of that change. Um, the next one is for 2019 to 2020, and um, PVFT's alternate calendar would like to move the professional development day from October 4th to November 1st, and that is the only change there. So this is the 2020 to 2021 calendar, and as I promised you, this was going to go to uh, Mr. Rodriguez. Um, and he's going to explain all the changes. And as you can see, it's a little bit more complicated. Yes. Okay, so the, the issue that, uh, or the, the feedback that we got um, from our members was that uh, starting on the second uh, full week of August uh, was a little earlier, and if it would be possible to start um, uh, later in August. And so, uh, the alternative that we're proposing is to remove the uh, SBC day in October from the original proposal to um, August so that we start um, the school year for teachers uh, starts on the 5th of August, I'm sorry, the 12th of August, the 12th and 13th would be SBC days, uh, the 14th would be the teacher work day with students starting on the 17th. And then on, uh, instead of having the 11th of January be a uh, day 
uh, be part of a winter break, it would be the SBC day. Okay, um, and of course this will would move everything uh, down, and uh, we would have um, a class as well on the fifth of April, as opposed to taking it as part of spring break. Um, I know a couple years ago, maybe more two two years ago, three years ago, uh, we did a similar uh, change where. Um, there had been a first reading of a calendar that we took to our members, we got feedback, and so we presented an, al an alternative within the uh, time uh, required by the uh, contract, and uh, that gave our members uh, an option. Um, and what we intend to do is, again, give them an option, either set A or set B. Um, they can't go one you know, one year from set A and one year from set B, it has to be all of A or all of B, okay? So don't don't worry about that. <laughs> um, other than that, uh, the some of the other reasons uh, for, for the uh, changes that we proposed, uh, we did have a number of, or, or we do have contract language which uh, requires uh, uh, four days for uh, after the end of the trimester, uh, four days for teachers to uh, complete report cards. And when those four days fall during parent conference week, it's, it's you know it's not really time to there's there's really no time to do your report cards. Um, we we know that one of the changes, uh, especially with the late uh, parent conferences. Um, is 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 a little problematic, but I think that um, uh, with the input that we received and the input that the administrators receive, I think um, that year uh, would be a good choice to uh, move the parent conferences up. Okay. Thank you. So we do not have any speakers to this item, so I am going to open up for questions from the board. Jeff? Uh, Hi. I understand you, you spoke to your uh, constituents, Francisco, but as, as you know, I have, kids the, I have kids in the district. My wife's a teacher. I, I, I have teachers at my house all the time. Um, and Welcome we, to calendar discussions. I know, right? Um, <laughs> and that's a blessing because I, I learn a lot. I learn a lot from, about their, um, their business. But uh, something that stuck out to me was the August, and I, we're getting into the weeds here, and, I, and I, I, that's not my intention. But I do want to ask the question. We talked about starting on, the kids were going to start on August 12th, which was a Wednesday. And the union is proposing to move it to August 17th, the, where the students start. Am I correct? Did I read it correctly? Correct. What, the feedback I've gotten and I've received and the feedback I've seen and what my eyes have seen with my kids is that kids, it's much easier for both students and teachers when you start a school year on a Wednesday. It gives the kids a couple days to kind of ease into it and then on that following Monday they're ready to go. It, that's when the school year really starts but we get them to school on Wednesday and kind of work them through that process. So that's again that's the feedback I've seen with my kids that's the and that's the feedback I've received from teachers. Um, so I'm a little bit surprised to hear that you're getting different feedback. Are you getting are you getting different feedback than what I just said? No, that's that's uh, that was within the parameters of uh, the survey that we conducted, and um, the um, the issue is that um, the way I would put it is that um, that uh, starting earlier is less desirable than starting on Mondays <laughs> than students starting on Mondays. They would rather um, start on the Monday and, and go the full week than start a couple days earlier. Then start, th then start earlier. Well, it's more than a couple of weeks because it's five days. Isn't uh, it? I'm sorry, more 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 than a couple of days um, because uh, the if you if if you start um, on a on on the tenth, if the teachers um, start on the tenth. Um, and they have uh, one work day and one SBC day, um, 
and then they have three, the, you know, then school starts, then, you know, they jump on the little wheel. Um, they still are going to be working on the weekend of the 8th and the 9th of August, whereas the, uh, the way it's going to start, they're going to start, they're going to have a work day on that Friday, and then if they want us, want the weekend to finish they they can so you can see how it's it, it it would work more but you are correct that is the input that we got and that's why the other two calendars um start in that way so it's okay thank you thank you okay anyone else yeah so, so just just to emphasize that um it's it, it's a what's less desirable is the question. <laughs> um, the lesser of two evils. That's mm -hmm. uh, thank you, um, Georgia. My question, Sean, is probably more directed to you. Um, CSEA has input on this as well, don't they? Survey their employees too, because this is an action item, but we're not seeing that input from CSEA. Uh, CSEA was um, they don't have an Article Five um, like PVFT does, which speaks directly to calendar, and there are procedures that we need to follow. CSEA um, was uh, there were participants in the district calendar committee right. and other. Um, you know, other people, not just the CSEA executive board, um, we had two of them in the calendar committee, but we also had Penny Colburn, who's attendance, um, you know, specialist for the district, participate as well as other directors uh, of transportation maintenance. And there, the, the important thing here, why um, it's a little bit more um, impactful on PVFT is this is the student calendar, um, and that's what we're presenting to you. And the classified employees have a different work year um, and the the student calendar and the uh, and the teachers calendar need to be more closely meshed um, because it is you know surrounding instruction as well as a professional development but that calendar will dictate the work days for CSEA employees yes <coughs> and CSEA was definitely um, part of, of the process and they had a voice to this okay thank you for the clarification okay. Kim but CSEA has their own calendar because they work more days than the teachers, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so, what, so you're asking for a motion tonight just to push these five calendars, or how many other five? Two different calendars six. with two, three two, years two, each. Two oh, right, with the two, three years each. That's where I'm two getting six. six. Yes. Um, okay, so that's what you need is a motion to push these out of committee so that they can go for votes. Yes. So they're going to be presented with six calendars? Or two two versions. Two two, two versions. options. Again, Option A is the the first reading that you did yeah. a, a few weeks back, and uh, option B will be the alternative that okay. you're seeing now. Great. So we don't really have any action except just allowing it to push forward. Okay. I'll make a motion. Do we have any other comments, yeah. Willie? Thank you. So, so uh, which of these options makes SBC days more effective for teacher meetings and learning stuff and whatever? Seems like if we spread them out, they aren't really effective because by the time you meet for one day and try to get ready, I, w I, would, I would think that, um, that it's a, a great time to have lunch and visit and all that, but... Which of these options are we going to get the most out of teacher training? So, so we had some ideas in calendar committee that are not reflected here, but you know they're not reflected, so I won't comment too much on them. But um, the what what I would uh, say is that when usually one of the SBC days, we, we, we have three SBC days. Um, usually one of them is a uh, like a site-based, a district-based, and then um, this year uh, we started uh, implementing the voice and choice uh, where, you know, it's, um, well, it's, it, it's, it's, it's continuing. But um, what makes it effective is when 
uh, we see the, the site-based um, uh, SBC days uh, very effective, um, especially if they're connected with a teacher workday, uh, because there's a greater possibility to actually uh, implement the training and prepare with it. Um, if you have uh, all district uh, directed SBC days, um, there's a there there's always some travel time ar around. So if you have a uh, training, for example, at the district office, um, it's it's hard to be at the training and then in between breaks or lunch, go to your room and get something done. Where if it's at the site, um, you know, it's it's easier to get things done, uh, whether before or after the training or during lunch or whenever um, the training is done. So our, our and, and this again is not reflected, uh, what we had um, commented or, or suggested was that, um, you know, one of these SBC days or within the SBC days that uh, the uh, teacher uh, preparation time, the work day, the time the teacher has in the classroom to prepare uh, be increased, uh, in other words, encroaching into the SBC day, uh, either district or site-directed training. Okay, but which, which of these options is, is the most effective for us to... If, so that the, varies the, by the, site, yes. by district, and by individual. So if you are interested in learning uh, new material that is being presented to you, you're going to make the, uh, the most of it. Uh, if you're not, it doesn't matter if you have all three together or all three separated. Well, but, but, but my uh, question is, so that we're going to vote on either of these options. The, the uh, first option in, with, in August that had uh, two days of of uh, S SPC days back uh, back to back seems seems to be the most effective. I don't know. Is that the one we're pro uh, proposing? You're referring to? Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> <laughs> Are we, you're not proposing both of those, both A's and B's. No, <laughs> we're the uh, the you're referring to the 2021, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that so so that that's what is um, what does the superintendent think of either the options? So I had mentioned to the board at the last meeting that you know I think we'll it is just one of the years it's not all the years but I I think it's just a matter of planning, right? So when they're spread out, you look at the training differently than when they're clustered together. Um, and so I think it's all, for me, either option, I believe that we can work with and work with staff and make sure that um, what time we do have, teachers have time to be in the classroom, staff have time to be in the classrooms and, and prepare their classrooms, and we also have time to be able to provide um, sufficient professional learning. Um, so for me, I, either one, we just have to know which one it is and we'll plan accordingly. So there is a motion on the floor. Can I get a second? I'll, I'll second. What was the motion? Uh, to uh, a and review. B, we're throwing them out oh, there. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm with you. So we have a motion. We have a second. Right? Yes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 601. <laughs> All right, now moving on to item 11.0, report and discussion items. 11.1, .1, update on the LCAP stakeholder input process, and the report will be done by Susan Perez. Good evening, Vice President Orozco, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, and members of the board. I think that's on. Um, you have the PowerPoint? Okay, thank you. Um, this evening I'm going to provide you an update on um, how 
we are um, conducting our stakeholder input sessions this year and the whole, the whole stakeholder input process for our LCAP. Um, we've been doing this for a few years now. And so I think um, most of you know that a big part of the development of an LCAP and the implementation of an LCAP involves having a process to gather stakeholder input from throughout the school community. Um, just to go back and um, kind of recap our LCAP, um, there The second um, big bucket has one goal, but it is a huge goal, and it is all about having um, safe, sound learning environments, facilities, appropriately credentialed teachers, and then um, standards-aligned instructional materials. The last area, the last big bucket has two goals, one um, regarding promoting a safe school environment, a positive school environment, um, where students want to come to school and also increasing parent participation. So after you approve our LCAP um, in June and it goes to the board, we begin the process of implementing. And um, part of that implementation is continuing to gather input from stakeholders to make sure um, that we hear their comments regarding the, the actual implementation that's going on during the year as well as gathering their input um, towards what they would like to see in terms of revisions for the following year. So we began our stakeholder input process in November, and uh, it is still ongoing and we'll be continuing to gather input throughout March. But for every single session that we have, we do review our current LCAP priorities and goals and then we highlight the actual actions that were um, involved in what are the new things that we're doing this year. And then we ask for input from all the different stakeholder groups. And our input has focused on two questions. After they've heard everything that we're, we're doing with the LCAP in the current year, what do they want to see continued? What are their priorities um, for the following year? And then what do they want to see changed? And so um, beginning in November, we went out to a number of groups. Um, the, these are um, some of the groups outside of parents and students that we went to. We did actually last week end up receiving um, input from PVFT. I have not heard back from CSEA yet, but we'll get that scheduled. And um, I do want you to note that the District Advisory Committee is, is a, in addition to all the outreach we do at the school sites, District Advisory Committee is another way to outreach to parents. This is where we invite the school site council president from every school to come together and have an additional opportunity to share with us um, their input and learn more about the LCAP process. And we're legally mandated um, to work with a parent group not only through the stakeholder input process, but then later on in the year to give us input on the draft that we develop for the following year. Um, we went out to um, parents at every single school um, during November and December. And then um, in February, we began what is my favorite part of the stakeholder input process. And I began talking to students. So I had, um, and this photo is from the middle school students, and the girl in the picture is describing to her friends um, the conditions at her school in the hallways. So um, it was, they had an animated discussion, and they were, this is the first year where the um, middle school students 
were not shy in any way, shape, or form. The first year I had to pull input from them. This time they came in with their list, they talked to other students, and they couldn't wait for me to quit talking so they could begin telling me what they wanted. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, we pulled reps from all the middle schools in uh, this week and had um, a lively session with them. And then I have gone to Aptos High School and Pajaro Valley High School, and Mark is going to help me out um, in the next couple of weeks by going to Watsonville High School. And we talk to two classes at each of the high schools. We talk to the leadership class, and then we go to a government econ class so that we're getting a broad spectrum of students um, and hear their voices. And you talk about Renaissance. Yeah, we still have to schedule Renaissance. That one, Mark's going to have to help me with that one as well. Um, I would like to say, um, before I talk about next steps, that um, there have definitely been patterns. One of the things that I'm really proud of and have been pleased to hear, in past years, um, there's been a huge emphasis on what they, people want to see added and what they want to see changed. And this year, what I'm hearing is what they want to see continued. Um, facilities has risen to the top of every single group who's given me input, um, but it has not been so much change everything as keep doing the good work you've started doing. We're, s we're starting to see um, improvements, but we need more. Please keep doing it. And um, definitely request for more custodians. Um, VAPA has been a high priority, but again, it has been Keep doing, keep building what you've started. We love the music, keep adding music. Um, and the socio-emotional counselors have, add, have risen to the top of every group. And again, it's not um, change something, but it's, that's been really helpful, keep doing it. And if you can add more, please add more. So that's been um, really nice to, to have all of these group recognize that we have listened to them, we are responding to the input, and they're seeing that it's making a difference and they want more. So our next steps um, as, as we finish the stakeholder input is to compile and analyze all of that input. And again, we really look for what rises to the top in terms of priorities, not only from individual groups, but across all the stakeholder groups. And then what's really important also is we review the outcome data for our current actions. So when we look at whether there need to be any revisions, it's based on a combination of these two. Um, we then make any revisions to the LCAP. This will be a little bit different this year than we've ever had before because in the past there's been more of an emphasis on continuing to revise. Last year for the first time we developed a three-year LCAP and there's only certain areas of it that we're actually allowed to revise um, for the three-year period. So it's a little bit different. It's, uh, parts of it are more static than they've been in the past. And then um, after we develop a draft for the 18-19 school year, we go back and we do, we give both the district advisory and DLAC an opportunity to take a look at it and give us input. Um, we then have a board um, meeting with public hearing where you and public have an opportunity to comment on it and provide input. Then we come back for board approval and the very last step in the process is to submit this to the County Office of Education, which we must do by the end of June. And so that is where we're at with the process right now and um, I'm happy to try to address any questions. So there's no speaker to this item. Board? Any comments or questions? Kim? Um, <coughs> The District Advisory Council, where you invite all the um, site council presidents, how, how was the turnout and how did those um, how did that session go? Um, the turnout this we haven't had the second one. The turnout this fall um, was so so. We did get um, I'd say about half the schools. I have told the schools if the school site council president can't make it to to please make sure someone from the school site council does come. Mm -hmm. um, we had good represent. In addition to the school site council reps, we also invite um, parent reps from um, special education and also foster youth. And um, we had good turnout from those groups this year. Not as many parents from school sites um, as I would like, but those parents who came really appreciated the process and did say that they were going to go back and, and try to promote more. And I'll, you know, I, we did promote it quite a bit, but I'll definitely do a strong push for that 
Um, we haven't set the date for the district advisory review and comment, but it will most likely be um, late April. And um, we'll be setting that date this week. Mm -hmm. And then we can start trying to get the word out on that. Because I, I really would like a bigger group. Can we also invite some of the home and school club presidents? Or I chairs? Don't, I don't see why not. Those are the, um, you know, as you know, parent groups that actually make improvements to the school through their efforts through fundraising. So they really have their finger on the pulse of mm -hmm. like things that need improvement. I think that would be fine. The, f the focus of that is really to get um, the voice of parents at the school sites. Yeah. Jeff? Okay. Susan, I, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that people acknowledge um, that we're making improvement on the facilities. But I have to tell you, that, that is a complaint I get all the time, and especially from parents from Aptos High, the, the poor condition of the school. And so even though I'm... I'm I'm really happy to hear, hey, we see you're making improvements, keep doing it. I gotta tell you, that's not the feedback I'm getting. The feedback I'm getting is, is we have a lot to do, why aren't you doing more? So when you're saying I'm getting that feedback, you're, are you not getting any pushback and then oh, what the oh. heck? What I was trying to say was, in terms of stakeholder input, facilities rose to the top as the number one need. Um, people are saying thank you for what you're doing, but absolutely, I'm hearing the same thing you are. That's their number one priority to continue and do more. Okay, so m maybe I misunderstood you. I, I may have um, misspoken, but I think you and I are hearing the same thing. Okay. Because that is what I'm hearing. I'm not hearing even anything about custodians. I'm hearing what is going on at that school. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you're you for welcome. Your clarification. Willie? So, so once we have a plan, Susan, um, relate how the budget process works with the plan to implement the plan. So, so that once we have the LCAP plan uh, or needs, mm -hmm. so how do we then take the revenue and make priorities? How will we... It is part of that process when I mentioned that we analyze the stakeholder input and then we look at our outcomes. Um, we develop priorities from that. And at that point in time, this, there, when LCFF first came out, um, what we were told in all of the trainings was this is where the business department and the educational department come together and begin working together. And at that point in time, um, as we, we as a cabinet really sit down and look through all this, representatives from the business department are there and we're talking, it's, si it's done simultaneously. So we're looking at um, the budget, we're looking at the priorities that we need to establish in the LCAP number one um, to address outcomes and needs that we've identified through the data analysis and also and in taking into account the voice of stakeholders and we look at those priorities and we look at the funding and we have to try to match them up. So, so uh, then, it, then it comes back to the board to vote on the priorities. Yes, it comes to the board twice. Right. With and LCAP and budget together. And so all that happens in June by the um, end. I believe this year we'll start bringing it to you in May, correct? I think we're gonna try to come the end of May or did I misunderstand that? Um, so that we have a full board, it will happen in June. Oh, it will be June, okay. So we have for the last few years brought, had the public hearing and the first um, draft come to you the first meeting in June, and then the final with um, taking into account any input you have the last meeting in June for approval. Okay, okay, well we're, we're uh, working, on, working on the process, the uh, planning process, and they're doing well with that, I think. So when, uh, when, when will we see the first draft of? The first meeting in June. The, f um, the, the first draft will come to the board with a public hearing at the first board meeting in June. Um, a yeah, so that we won't, we, won't, we won't have a chance to look at, look, at the, look at the findings of all of the LCAP meetings? Um, we can certainly bring um, some of that analysis to the board or um, but Dr. It, uh, Rodriguez, but do you have a timeline be, you'd like to add to that? But it actually won't be ready yet for public. Yeah. So what 
Mm -hmm. speak. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, um, what we can do is we can, I can already provide you, we can provide you this year's LCAP. I will say that um, the modifications are generally slight, right? Um, where we look at additional funding that we're coming in and then where do we spend that and where do we influence that. But we can definitely look at this year's because that's a really good base of knowing this is the springboard. Um, and then what we can do, and this is what we usually do for the board, is then we highlight the changes that are happening. So right. what's the difference between the current year LCAP plan and, ne and next year's LCAP plan? Um, but we can start those conversations even as of now looking at the current LCAP plan. So we can make sure and give that to you and I can go over it with anyone that would like to. Okay, so then, so then my uh, first question of, of the night was um, ongoing monies versus one-time one monies. Mm -hmm. So in this LCAP plan, we, we uh, could in fact get one-time money for... C, uh, C T, C T. Yes. So and it has to be spent there. Right. And so that, that has been, prior to my arrival, that, that has been somewhat of a challenge in that the we did receive one-time monies and have been receiving one-time monies for approximately five years, and that hasn't, that hasn't necessarily been spent. Um, this past year was the first year that we did a resolution to actually allocate some of that money to facilities to, bon um, to the 3200 bonus and those type of things. Um, but that is included within the LCAP. Um, we just designated it as one-time funding, LCFF one-time funding. And and I just want to comment uh, on on the of uh, on the uh, facilities needs, the uh, board before we voted on the bond um, on the size of the bond, we were able to single out over three hundred million dollars worth of needs buildings that had to get fixed, and so that that the board voted to maximize the bond at one hundred and fifty million. Knowing and so that we we knew going into this that we were not going to be able to fix everything, so so as as we fix facilities now, people can see that we're actually doing stuff. Words are sure of this. Well, we just ran out of money, basically because we were 150 million short going in. So so I just wanted to put that out on the record. Thank you. So just a couple of suggestions for me. I know that last year I did um, ask uh, if it would be possible to provide um, additional access for uh, parents to be able to provide feedback online, whether it would be directly on our PBUSD website or on school websites. So I think we, could, we should still explore that option if we're having a hard time getting parents to attend the info sessions. Um, in addition to that, uh, I know that the parent conference um, was very successful. And uh, like it, uh, I think it was uh, President DeRose mentioned that there was hundreds of parents uh, in attendance. So if we know that that's an event that's successful, um, I think it would be a good idea to have an info, like uh, maybe an hour dedicated uh, to provide feedback. Okay. So um, those you. are my two cents. And that I think that it would contribute to, to greater feedback from parents. Okay. Definitely. We'll make, make note of that. I did want to let you know that last year when you requested a parent survey, we did put that on the website. It's still there. Okay. We, it probably, we'll need to update it this year based on the questions we're asking. But um, yes, we did the go ahead. The visible? Because I've been to our PVUSD <laughs> website, and I think there's just so much there that oh. it's really hard to... On the main page, there's a link on the left-hand side that says LCAP and LCAP input, um, and you just click on that link, and the survey is there on the far left. Yeah, but I mean, that, that tells me when I read that, it's, oh, I'm going to find out about LCAP. doesn't necessarily say, oh, click here so you can provide direct feedback. So I don't know okay. if it's changing um, uh, the verbiage around that or making it more centralized. Okay. Or just putting those words in there, she's saying. All right. Um, so, so thank you for that. Sure. Do you, um, just to clarify, do you think if instead of saying survey, it said input, that that would be helpful? Submit, um, 
the major feedback for the LCAP. You know, something that's really okay. straightforward. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, board. Moving along, in item 11.2, Bright Bytes technology, technology Use Data. And we'll so my report. Members of the board and Dr. Rodriguez, uh, Dan Weiser is here with his team tonight to update you guys and present some information around their Bright Bytes survey and the use of and, and implementation of technology across the district. So I'm excited to turn it over to him and let him share some of the data we got back from our input. Great. Really quickly, I'm going to have the podium raised up for Dan because he needs it. Uh, I'm just making an announcement that we're doing a web to, um, web to go meeting from someone in Las Vegas. And Dan can introduce Nicole List. Yeah, well. L Nicole, can you hear us? We're going to turn up your volume in just a moment. Okay. How about Dan? Can you hear Dan? Well, I haven't spoken yet, so it's hard to say, but <laughs> <laughs> good evening, uh, trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, thank you for having us tonight. Um, my name is Dan Weiser. I'm the Assistant Director for Technology Services for the district. And with me, I have Courtney Rudd, who's one of our district technology innovation coaches. And remotely, we have Nicole Kalis, hopefully, if she can hear us. Is she in there? Great. I can hear you. Okay, and Nicole is a former teacher uh, and one of our partners working with us from Bright Bites. Um, and Bright Bites has allowed us to gather and analyze a lot of data related to technology and 21st century skills, technology integration in our classrooms, and a variety of other technology related issues. Um, and so we're focusing on some very specific areas that actually relate directly to the LCAP goals. Um, and tonight, uh, Courtney and Nicole are going to kind of go through some of that, right? I'm waiting for the PowerPoint. Yeah. There we go. And now I'll lower it. Now we can lower the mic. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, this is our first slide, so let's go to the second slide. Okay, so for the past three years, we've had this technology use survey um, distributed or given, and our numbers are excellent in terms of response rates. If you calculate, assuming that we have about 20,000 students on our campus or in our district, this is grades 3 through 12 that take it, and we had over 10,000 students participating. So that's probably about 70% of our 3 through 12. Um, additionally, we had over 1,000 teachers and administrators take it. Again, that's a huge saturation of how many uh, participated. And then we distribute this to parents. And again, I feel like we had a pretty successful uh, parent rate. It's the most difficult group to get because we have to do it based on volunteer, you know, asking, submitting, et cetera. Um, so with that, um, the amount that has responded, it shows much better clarity in the data because it's much more accurate the more numbers that you have. Next cool. slide. Still there, Nicole? Okay, hey, can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. There you go. Good in advance. Next slide. For a second. Okay, next slide. Okay. Uh, well, I apologize for not being there in person. I can't travel due to current medical conditions. Um, but I just want to let you know I've had the pleasure of working with Courtney and Dan and Dan and their teams over the past to annual collections, so those heard in the fall. And my role here is to support your district with implementation, so getting the surveys pushed out, visualization, and then working with your trainers, your principals, your tech leads on, on assisting them as well as the district on how to make your data actionable. And so what Courtney described is how we collect the data. So this is a, one of our survey-based modules. And then we visualize it, and the intention here is uh, to create an easy to read and navigate navigational, navigatable dashboard that you can easily understand areas that are exciting to see, or we like to frame it as celebrations, and then areas that are gaps or opportunities for growth. So what you see right here is your district's overall dashboard view. 
you'll notice it's organized into four main areas, so classroom, access, skills, and environment. We call this the CASE framework for short. And this was a meta-analysis um, or created by a meta-analysis over 2,200 research articles and case studies that distilled the four most prominent factors pertaining to successful use of technology in the classroom, linked back to access to devices, skills to use those devices, the environment surrounding the use of those devices, and then lastly and ultimately, um, the types of activities conducted with the devices in the classroom. Everything in the dashboard is color-coded according to the case score legend. And just in layman's terms here, we don't want to fixate too much in scores. This is a formative assessment, shows growth over time. You will see fluctuations in different areas, um, but we're seeing good, good news. Pajaro seeing growth in the classroom consistently, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but wherever you see orange, that indicates uh, the middle of the road or average. The average case score is 1050. You see Pajaro's overall case score is 1061. Areas that are marked in gray or pink are gaps or opportunities for growth, and those that are marked green or blue are areas of celebration or what are what's going well based on the case score continuum, so signs of a more advanced uh, district organization. Just to give you a sense of how the data moves here, and so the inner two domains tend to move the most rapidly per our trends analysis. Uh, we uh, have been collecting data from thousands of districts across the country and have seen that the access and skills domain do move the most quickly again and have the highest overall case score or placement on the continuum here. As you can see in Pajaro's case, they're following that trend as well as these two inner domains overall are advanced. The outer two, on the other hand, is where a lot of second order change occurs, where you're, um, you know, teaching uh, folks skills to apply in the classroom. As you know, that definitely takes more change over time and that's verified by our trends analysis as well. You see that overall the environment surrounding the use of technology within your classroom, so this pertains to the climate, professional learning, um, conversations such as observations that are had on technology um, is falling overall in the proficient range and the classroom domain is your lowest, but this is going to be very common. Um, that's emerging, and you'll see different areas that comprise this particular domain as well. You can view the data in many different ways. Please note this presentation just contains just several snippets, and so you can get a very high-level sense of where you're moving, so kind of helping your district and your schools um, decide, you know, where's north? Are we moving in the right direction when it comes to um, integrating technology? What skills could we focus on? Um, this view is nice in that it shows the comparison of your district's data within its own collections over the past years. As you can see, you're seeing an overall increase throughout the years, as well as it's occurring within each of the four domains. We also included the California aggregate on your dashboard, and that includes about 12, not about, but 12 county offices, about 1,500 schools, about 180 districts, and 1.8 million students. It's exciting to see that Pajaro is a little bit ahead of the curve there um, when it comes to overall score and more excitingly in the classroom domain where it's harder to affect change there. The top aggregate right here represents all schools that are on the dashboard and their score uh, as of yesterday. And um, we do have some schools in five other countries, including Sweden, Australia, and a few others. I can get the names if you want. Um, and as you can see, our house just in line with those as well. Okay. So one of the areas we're going to move into is celebration, and we extracted certain points out of that data to, to talk about in terms of celebration as well as correlating them with the LCAP goals. So it kind of worked that we're going right after Susan's presentation. <laughs> um, so one thing that we um, do well at the district as well as at home is the access to internet and devices is really high. And so that bears fruit for the amount of investment we've taken in terms of the one-to-one -one Chromebook and the infrastructure for Wi-Fi. And it also shows up at the home. And where that's important is that if kids or teachers are being able to provide or being able to access the internet at home, they're more likely to bring it into the classroom. And one of the areas that we've been working with in the district is to improve the home access for students, internet access for students, and we're seeing an uptick in that. 
in terms of the data. Last year it was 85 percent, and now it's 87 percent. And there's also uh, areas that the board and the district have done to try to improve that by having like the smart buses, which is Wi-Fi on the buses, uh, the T-Mobile hotspots going home, uh, the partnership with the city to provide Wi-Fi in the plaza, the businesses that um, Dr. Rodriguez has worked with to bring Wi-Fi to kids when they don't have it at home. So that's an area, I think, for celebration. The next data point we have to pull out, so notice how zoomed in we are before we had that really high-level view, and all we did was click into a particular area. These data points were pulled from the environment domain, so that climate area, and excitingly, 81% of your teachers, so that's represented by the striped, excuse me, the solid bars on the top, and then 83% of your parents are represented by the striped bars on the top. In addition to that, 60% of your students either strongly agree or agree they want to learn more about effective technology used for teaching and learning. And research shows is that teachers' beliefs, and it kind of makes sense, are actually more influential than their actual knowledge. So this is really exciting to share in that, one, it's very challenging to change folks' beliefs. And then, two, it also shows that your teachers, your parents, and pretty much your students are overall on the same page of, Yes, we are interested in learning more, um, and then we can delve into other ways of how we can best support them. Okay, another area that's worthy of celebration is that teachers' online skills, so pulling one of those skill sets, foundational skill sets in utilizing technology, is improving. And we think a lot of that has to do with using Google Apps for Education or the G Suite. And so one of the data sets is teachers reported ease of collaborating using online documents, and that continues to tick up. And as you see, we've got most teachers at the very easy level. And once they're feeling comfortable with collaborating online with themselves, or I mean with their peers, then that's more likely to translate into the classroom. And we're seeing that as well. So collaboration being done digitally is improving. And this is kind of what Courtney was referring to right here. So again, just kind of connecting the skills that your teachers are developing in their session to actual classroom practice. So one ma a major area of the classroom domain that we saw earlier was teacher and student use of the four C's. So if you're not familiar with the four C's, um, this was a set of standards developed by the Partnership for 21st Century Skills and the National Education Association um, in the late teens of 2000s um, that really describe essential characteristics that students um, need to have in order to be uh, proficient as well as to have uh, be competitive in this global society. So the, they identify the four main overarching skills that can be applied in any discipline as communication, critical thinking, collaboration, and creativity. So this particular data point is pulled from the collaboration element of the four C's. And it talks about how students are asked by their teachers specifically to collaborate online with their peers. Just from working with Courtney, for example, we work remotely all the time. I've been there several times on site for trainings and things like that. But the majority of our work is done online, as well as um, based out of being based out of Silicon Valley. A lot of the work is just everything is done online there. So, giving kids real life exposure to that type of work. And excitingly, yes, the growth may seem small. The current data is represented by the solid bars, whereas your data from last year, it's last fall, so fall of 2016 is represented by the stripe. Uh, but it does show that your teachers are moving in the right direction. So ideally, they're applying the skills they're learning in those training sessions around learning how to collaborate on themselves. And research shows that teachers are more comfortable doing that type of skills. They're more likely to integrate it into their pedagogy and apply it with students. So um, congrats here. Okay, so again, um, based on having one-to-one -one computing devices, so the Chromebook program, um, teachers are beginning to utilize more or asking their students to develop or present with multimedia presentations. That's a really um, strong skill within the Common Core State Standards, and it's embedded throughout all the standards from K-12. So we're starting to see improvement in technology and having that, them right in the hands of the kids 
provides them a lot of opportunities to do that digitally. We're seeing a lot of video production, website development. Obviously, you know, the, the classic Google Slides or PowerPoint, if you want to call it that. And so those things are improving, and the kids get really engaged and excited about it. So that's Another aspect of the data includes understanding what teachers are interested in learning more about when it comes to ed tech. Um, this pertains back to LCAP school number four. Um, and so really kind of tying or tapping into what teachers are interested in learning more about and tying it back to the four C's and ultimately, Courtney just mentioned uh, the common core state standards. And so um, excitingly, teachers are reporting that they do this is a multi-select question, so I won't add up to 100%. There's seven other options here. But their top three interests are multimedia skills, which relate back nicely to the creativity component of the four Cs that we just saw data point on. They want to learn how to use online tools for the more for critical thinking, relates back to their critical thinking component of the four Cs. And then lastly, classroom management technology, which could mean a variety of things here. Um, Interestingly, I know there's been a lot, a lot of sessions from what I've heard from working with Courtney and her team, um, but research shows that teachers need at least 14 hours of high quality TV in a single topic for effective classroom teaching. And a lot of district and school leaders scoff at this thing, you know, it's very challenging to, uh, to, to obtain. Um, but I just want to put that in the forefront, you know, that, that was expressed as a need in the other parts of the data that we could take a look at later. Um, but just again, capitalizing off what teachers are interested in learning more about. This data point is the district level. It can also be disaggregated to the, by the schools, so it can be personalized by grade levels of schools. So, for example, elementary, middle, and high school. And then, lastly, within a school um, by grade. So, really offering that personalized view of what teachers are interested in learning more about. And to dovetail on that, I've gone out to sites to help them review the data, and this is one really powerful area, and it kind of goes with Dr. Rodriguez's voice and choice initiative because we can in immediately drill down in his technology innovation coaches, it becomes very apparent what the teachers are already requesting. It makes it er very easy to customize our PD around their needs. Okay. So another opportunity for growth is in the area of digital citizenship. And this is a constant problem, I think, in society in general to get students to understand how to, how to behave and act online appropriately and professionally. And so we still need a continual, continual emphasis on that. And generally, we've been doing it um, to comply with E-rate. And we request that each site provides two sessions on uh, digital citizenship topics per year. And we're finding that that is not adequate enough for today's needs. And so that, you know, an additional area that that addresses that's pretty obvious is cyberbullying and how we can continue to work on that and embed it more in our curriculum on a daily basis, especially because we have the Chromebooks in front of us. So the opportunities there. Use your notes since I didn't bring my glasses. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, some of the key points, uh, some of the strengths that we uh, were able to find in the, through the looking at the data and analyzing the data and working with uh, Brightbytes on analyzing the data. Um, we went through some of the different aspects of some of our successes in terms of teacher progress and, you know, areas that students are making progress. Um, we were seeing an increase in the quality of, you know, 21st century skills related to the four C's. Um, uh, and then obviously we've identified some areas where we, we want to put more energy, more emphasis, more resources, and more professional development. And I think that's one of the key components for us is um, we're able to use this data to identify specific areas that we know we can put more resources, more time, and you know, gear training toward the specific needs that we're seeing in the school sites, making sure that teachers have the resources and the training they need to be providing students with you know, 21st century skills, getting them ready for college and career. Um, and so partnering with Bright Bites has really allowed us to, you know, see the actual data itself and be able to tell where our work is, you know, having an impact and areas that we really need to start to focus some other uh, energy and some more professional development. So I also want to applaud Courtney. She put an incredible amount of work into this and she's been doing an amazing job. And also Nicole has helped us a lot to kind of not just gather the data, but understand it and figure out what it means and what actions we can take to increase, you know, 
student uh, learning across the board. So that's that. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. We don't, we don't have any speakers to this item, so I'll bring it back to the board. Any comments, questions, highlights? Karen followed by Kim. Well, I'm just so amazed that we're doing so well on this. I mean, what makes us do so well on this and not so good on other things in terms of, I mean, what do you think, what do you think has, you know, we're, I mean, we're higher than the rest, I mean, we're as high as people in the whole world, whatever. I mean. <laughs> right, we're, we, we are, so in some areas we are seeing that we're above the average. Um, yeah, that's what, it, that's what right, I've read about, right. that's what I was reading about. You know, there's a, I mean, there's a variety of things that we've been doing over the past several years. Uh, obviously, having district technology innovation coaches and the cadres that they've been doing, they've trained, you know, near, now we're about, to, about two thirds of the teachers in the district um, and worked really closely with them. Also, the liaison program that we have in place, and we do a whole bunch of other professional development. And then there's work that's being done at the school sites themselves. We have heat seekers, uh, teachers. You have what? That, that's what, one of Dr. Rodriguez's words. There are teachers that are already kind of implementing some of these 21st century skills. Uh -huh. They've already transitioned their instruction into kind of a, a more, you know, student-centric uh, model. And so other classes, other teachers at the schools are starting to be, you know, be able to, you know, co collaborate with them and implement some of those as well. But I think truthfully, What's really making the most difference is a lot of the professional development, and that's really because of Courtney and Harendra and Miranda, our, our district technology innovation coaches, in terms, at least in terms of technology integration itself and the work that they've been doing has really made a big difference. Well, thank you so much <laughs> for that. <laughs> and I would also yeah. add that there's been a, a lot of emphasis on the infrastructure. If you don't have the good access to the devices and to the Wi-Fi, then there's you're not going to be able to do much digitally in the classroom. Uh, uh -huh. So I think continued effort on that and the refresh of the computers and attention to that in terms of expanding our um, staff in, in site techs, that all makes a huge difference because without that, then you can't grow the rest of the program. Uh -huh. The bond, you know, putting in the TVs and the sound systems throughout the district, I think that's made a, a huge improvement. So. Uh -huh. Wow. Kim? Yeah. This is super exciting. Thank you very much for this great presentation, and thanks to the Bright Bite people for helping us pull all this data together. Um, some of you have heard me say this little story, but I have to just say it again, just for people who might not have heard it. But when I first started in this district with my own kids, when I don't know, I have a 20 year old, so that was 15 years ago, at Valencia Elementary, there really wasn't a single working computer except in the office. And I wrote the first grant, we put in the first computer lab, and then you know, I worked very closely with the principal to say, okay, now get these classrooms, every single classroom needs to rotate through so that we can get these kids typing at least, just to do you know, basics. And that was hard. There was probably a handful of teachers there who were in their 70s or close to 70 who had zero skills using technology. And so we hired Don Binder, who's now at PCCS. She's a Crystal Apple Award winner. She was a stay-at-home mom, I think, at the time. And she came in and did professional development with those teachers on that campus. So we've come a long way. <laughs> so I just would like to congratulate you. I, it's just great. I mean, partly we have more funds now. We have equity for the Aptos area schools because for so long all that technology just went south and central. And I'm really very pleased at um, the equity and the, and the uh, opportunities that um, have taken place that are so different than even 10 years ago. So thank you for all your work. Jeff? I think I said earlier, and I'm going to say it again, never follow Kim DeSerpa. Um, but I, she's absolutely right. When Even when I started on the board in 2011, we didn't have the equity that we now have in Aptos. And, and there's an assumption that this is not an Aptos issue. It is an Aptos issue, just like it's a Watsonville issue. And so it, it is very exciting to see these numbers. It's very exciting to see this growth. And the reality is, and I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but this is really the wave of the future. You know, I gave um, my... I, I gave someone that I work with the other day, I asked her to typewrite something. She did not know how to use a typewriter, literally. She was 26 years old. She didn't know how to put paper into a typewriter. Uh, so I, I, it's wonderful that we are trained. We miss the 26-year-olds, but we'll get the 12-year-olds today. So again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is really exciting and great to see. Anyone else? 
Okay, so I just want to highlight the area of celebration, Access at Home. That has been something that has been really close to my heart. Um, and it's amazing what we've been able to accomplish um, in large part uh, due to Michelle coming in and also because of the board, the board giving direction to invest in that area, especially when we're uh, moving towards 21st century learning. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that, um, but I'm still concerned about the 13% that don't have access at home. So what are we doing with those kids? Well, just recently, like in January, we have put out uh, those T-Mobile hotspots to every site in the district. It's a limited number, but with that, students can check out through the library, having access to the internet that will use cellular network. So they can take it home and they'll be able to get on the internet and, and do what they need to do. And that also is intended to help the families develop some internet skills as well and appreciation of it. And then Charter just came out with a low income uh, home internet program, which most of um, Watsonville is serviced by the Charter program or by Charter communication. So there's areas we're seeing growth. And so next year we're hoping that when the survey comes back out that that number will continue to rise. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> Thank you. Nicole. Take care. Okay, moving right along. Um, item 12.0 consent agenda. Uh, before I ask for a motion, I would like the board to consider pulling item 12.3, 12.4, and 12.5. I think Francisco brought up some good points, and I would like uh, for um, for us to just relook at those MOUs and determine whether changes um, are necessary. I, I'd agree. So, uh, so I would make the motion to approve the consent with item items uh, 12, uh, 12 point3, 12.4, 12.5 be uh, deferred. A second. Um, okay. So um, I don't really want to pull them off. I want to defer them so we defer can have them. a conversation and see if all of our questions are answered. Me here. too. Okay. We can okay. go ahead and do that. So we have a motion on the floor and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, motion carries. Six, no, five, zero, three. Um, okay. Uh, Jeff is, yeah, I'm sorry, five, zero, two. That's right, I'm sorry. <laughs> So, Dr. Rodriguez, is there somebody here who can speak to 12.3? Nancy, Nancy? Okay. Oh, great. All right, but, um, okay, 12.3. Good evening. So, the um, parent education nursery schools. We have had um, um, a, a situation where we wanted them to be like the Watsonville Co-op. And that is where the parents paid the fees to the school, and then we paid the teachers. But the parent groups in Santa Cruz did not want that. So again, this year we said, then you collect the fees, and they have all the money, and then we bill them for the teachers. So that's how um, this, I mean, we've been negotiating this back and forth, and this was the understanding that we had was that they would pay, they would, we would bill them and they would pay for the teachers because they have all the funds. We don't have the funds. Just like Santa Cruz City asked us to take all of their AEBG funds and operate their schools, this is like a nonprofit giving us the funds and asking us to um, administer the program. So that's kind of where we are. Now, the part about uh, that Francisco brought up, that uh, we, he didn't want the, the teachers involved, we were told that they did not want the teachers to have to fundraise for their salaries. So that, that's why number six was in there. Is that kind of what you're asking? I don't know what are the questions you have. Um, so I do want to bring it back to the board, Willie. Thank you. Um, 
You know, I've been thinking about this, Nancy. Why do we want to do this? Not one of, not why are we reaching out beyond our district? Not one of these children going to this nursery school will be feeding to our school district, and and it uh, seems to me that we should be really focusing in. We have enough problems here, trying to raise test scores, et cetera, et cetera, w without trying to go outside of the area and. Uh, let's work on our children here with the uh, with uh, programs here. I I don't understand why we're trying to go outside the area and um, trying to administer some some other school district. Each of these employees become our employees, Correct. and and so that's my second major problem with this is is that the um, the uh, benefit. A structure and all of those things what what if we negotiate and reduce the overall plan of benefits what's been promised these people over there I I have no idea I have, I have no idea what and 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 as a as a satellite area I don't think that we have the control or the need for this program my, I guess my response is that this was between the two superintendents prior to Dr. Rodriguez, that there was a, uh, a negotiated agreement. Santa Cruz City Schools did not want to operate the um, adult education program in Santa Cruz City. And there was signed agreements that came to the board. Actually, adult education, we did not have input into the MOU. But let me just, well, pardon me, if, if, if they have the funds, if they have a nonprofit, and, and they're funding everything, and, and, and if this program is such a worthy program, why is the Santa Cruz City Schools not running this program? I don't know. There's something missing here in, in this whole thing. If, if it's all fully fin funded and not at and we're not at risk because they have the funds. Why don't they run it? I, I you know, I don't get it. They, um, I, this was an MOU that was signed with our district. We were kind of told to implement it. Not that we were opposed, but when we were we were brought in, it was like this is the MOU, this is the agreement, and the two superintendents agreed. And that's where we are. Uh, it went to the board. What's coming back to us now? <laughs> now this is just for the for the preschools, or the the parent nursery schools. The this aspect of it. But overall, the the we've been told to administer the program. Michelle, would you part of this meeting? Were you um, mm -mm. had? Were you in, um, Did you participate in creating this MOUs? So I I have been brought up to speed. Um, Francisco and I meet weekly. He has brought up the concern to me, not not necessarily about the concern with this MOU, but about the teachers being required to fundraise for their benefits and them being asked to specifically. Um, sign agreements that they didn't necessarily shouldn't sign and that should go to this board instead. So I was definitely, um, I understood the concern and I knew that there has been some back and forth. I was not present when this MOU was done. Um, I think um, there's been support that's been provided by the district office on this. Um, but I was not present when this MOU was done. I will say just to Willie's point is um, we're kind of at the point that we're at right now, right? Um, we've taken on the program, those, that, those staff members, which is why um, Francisco spoke to it, um, those staff members are now considered our staff members. Um, anything that happens with our staff members in essence happens for them, so if we, give them a 6% raise, they too get a 6% raise. If we do a change in health and welfare, 
they receive a change in health and welfare because they now technically are are our um, are our staff members. I am in favor, which I probably shouldn't say all this, but I am in favor of maintaining Santa Cruz um, seniority separate from our seniority um, because I do feel that the moment that you start infusing, um, it becomes impossible to detangle if at one time we choose that this MOU is not working for us. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we do that. I'm just saying the more that we um, commingle things, the harder it is to disentangle. Um, so that what would be the steps that we would need to do to make that happen? To basically give Santa Cruz back their teachers? Is that what the question is? To not commingle. It would you're probably be very painful, <laughs> to be truthful, because those teachers are now our teachers, and um, regardless of what people want to say, people want to stay with us because um, they don't want to go back to Santa Cruz where they have to pay fifty. And it's it's not quite a fifty fifty split, but a fifty fifty. It was originally a fifty fifty split of their benefits, because they there's a seventy thirty split now on increases. It's not quite fifty fifty, but I would assume that they don't want to go back um, to that because they also when they retire they maintain benefits that they wouldn't receive if they were with Santa Cruz City Schools. So it would. Um, it would take a lot of work um, and probably do some things off of attrition, <laughs> I would assume, versus um, flat out. It, it would be difficult to disentangle it. But, but having the seniority list combined make it even more difficult to disentangle if we ever decide to do that. Um, I, I have said and been criticized for it, but I do, um, I feel that my central role is to be an advocate for PVUSD. And so I am always very vocal that I don't want any PVUSD funding going towards um, Santa Cruz City School um, programs. So I will say I am concerned about this program because basically if it falls on us, then and the board can make that decision, but we would um, basically it would be PVUSD funding going toward for Santa Cruz um, residents. And I personally don't want us to spend our money on them. Okay. Any other questions? So um, Francisco mentioned that currently they have bumping rights to, to the Watsonville teachers. Is that right? Is that correct? Um, well, I'll ask Chona and, um, and Nancy to, to speak to that. I will say um, it's up to interpretation. My preferred right. interpretation is that they don't have bumping rights. Um, I want to keep them separate, um, but I'm here, Francisco, to save the day on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Francisco, we need your help to figure out what to do. <laughs> Yes, this is a, uh, one of our points that Francisco and I and Shona have been talking about quite a bit lately, but it wasn't necessarily brought about by the Penn's teachers per se. Um, it's a different issue, but the Penn's teachers, um, this was their MOU. F frankly, the sticking point was immunization. They didn't want to sign these MOUs because they didn't want to have their children immunized. And then some of the parents were saying, well, I won't send my child there because they're not immunized. And then you have other parents saying, well, we're not going to immunize our students, our children. So it was back and forth. And finally they said, okay, we're going to have all the children immunized. So the immunization policy was the sticking point on the MOU, not the point that Francisco talked about, however, we had um, talked about that the teachers did not need to fundraise to pay for their salaries. That was another sticking point, and I thought we'd put that in. That was our recommendation. What we thought was the recommendation from the teachers was to put that in there. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure what the answer is yet on the bumping rights. I guess we just don't know. But, you know, um, Santa Cruz City, I well, actually, I don't know who it has it, but somebody, some entity in Santa Cruz actually holds a lot of um, migrant child care slots in the Pajaro area. Um, so their whole, they have kids, they're getting ADA for and money for to serve kids in our area, which I don't like that either. So I'm actually, the more kids that we serve, I think great. But um, do normally in a program like this, do we receive funding like ADA or something on, on children at preschools or how are, how are these programs actually funded? They're uh, self-funded. 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 So if there was any overlap with the fees or anything like that, it would have to come out. of the pens that we have including the ones in our own district like is there what is the benefit to Pajaro is there any or could there be any that we know about um, yeah I, I think ours are self-sustaining um, my understanding is they're self-sustaining I we could um, you know again being more myopic on PVUSD. I've, I've ensured that our grant writer is focusing on grants that support PVUSD schools and children. And so I haven't directed her to even look at um, trying to find funding, um, grant funding for this. So I, I can't say whether they're out there or not because I haven't been focusing on that. Okay. Is there any, is there any benefit to us other than a gr mm -mm. larger workforce to support? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I see what the I'm, benefit I'm, is. I'm not sure that okay. there is. Nancy, do you see a benefit to this? Um, what I see is that the two superintendents um, collaborated. They did not want adult education to go away in Santa Cruz. We had a, a supportive program that you have supported in PVUSD, yeah. and they didn't have much in Santa Cruz. They had an administrator that went there maybe once every couple of weeks to just drop in the office. It was a very different type of program. And um, the agreement was, well, we don't want adult education to go away in Santa Cruz. So we have it. So we have their funds and our funds, and we have two programs. So is this program hooked to adult education in that the parents of these children attending these preschools are participating in adult ed? It's like a cooperative preschool, so they're learning parenting skills. Okay, so that is a It's a adult benefit. education. Yeah, okay, so I, I, now I see the connection. Okay, mm. thank you. Erin, well, well, followed I just, by Willie. <clears throat> I still, I still, I don't, I still so, I don't, don't totally understand this. Because I don't, I don't, I don't understand how the teachers are paid if they're getting our benefits, and how are the teachers, how are the teachers paid? Are they paired through us? They paid through us. Because you're talking about they're getting our benefits and all that kind of stuff. The nonprofit um, board, but fundraisers, but they are paid through us. I mean, they, they pay us. I mean, we bill them. We pay the checks. They get their checks from PBUSD. Their checks. So we pay for the employees, the teachers working for us, right, to sustain this program in Santa Cruz, right. And then what we do is we bill city schools for the money that we paid out to those teachers. Well, are we the nonprofit, the nonprofit organizations, nonprofit. the the preschools? 
individually. There are three of them. So they individually have to pay the money to the district because we pay out to the teachers. Okay, and then- Because they're part of PVFT. Sure, and so where is the partnership with Santa Cruz Schools then? So if there's two separate budgets and that money's coming directly from us, then where is their investment? From Santa Cruz Schools. I mean, where, where is the money coming? Is, is there money coming from the Santa Cruz Schools to pay the teachers? Is they help Not the for teachers? the, well, from the preschool, the nonprofit agencies do that part, but for the teachers that are in Santa Cruz City Schools, there's the Santa Cruz Adult Education Block Grant funds that are utilized to pay those teachers who are now part of PVUSD. We, we, issue, the t we issue the teachers the check and they are participating in our um, ben health and welfare benefit system. And so what we do after that is um, so far um, all of that has been absorbed by the nonprofit organizations. So we bill them for the benefits and the salary, and all of that so far has been absorbed by the nonprofit organization um, with their own fundraising or however they're able to obtain their money. Um, okay, there is no additional money uh, currently, to my understanding, that's coming out of um, PVFT funds for these programs. It's been totally absorbed by the nonprofit. Including the benefits? Yes. Mm. Is there any money coming from uh, Santa Cruz uh, City Schools? Well, their adult education block grant funds come to our district to pay for their teachers and their supplies, whatever they need at their school. We're just managing it. So, so that the only other way that they, that, that the only other source of money seems to be... Um, um, a cookie sale once a month or something, some the fundraising method. Whatever they do for their fundraising, however, if there are additional funds in the Santa Cruz, I don't know if I want to, this is very confusing, but if you needed their block grant funds, it's possible they could utilize some of that if, if they needed to because it, it falls under the one of the seven areas under the block grant. Well, uh, I think uh, Francisco said earlier that uh, that this plan is going to fail within two or three years financially. Would you like to add to that? What so the, what's the, so, so the reality is that the, the, the nonprofits don't have the capacity to fundraise at the level that they need to. And so the, uh, the, what you need to do is devise a plan with them that will allow them to either uh, fundraise enough to continue the program uh, you know, at, a, at, a, at a, a, a level that they can so that they can close down their program. Um, or they may want to talk about integrating uh, into one nonprofit or they may want to, you know, to do whatever they, they need to do. Um, the reality of the situation is that uh, they are having a hard time uh, with enrollment. This is a, a program not for the children, it's a program for the adults. And so uh, having the, you know, meeting the, the requirements as an adult, for example, to attend uh, during the day and be part of the program and be there with the children and learn the parenting skills takes a big investment, not so much in money, but in time. So it, it, uh, what, what you need to do is provide them with the support so that they can either um, integrate the three nonprofits or uh, close, them, close them down in a way that is uh, equitable and that uh, those six teachers there um, have a, a time to make plans and, uh, you know, I mean, that would be the reasonable thing to do. Um, and then just to add, I do want to add a couple um, uh, clarifications. Uh, you compared it with the Watsonville Cooperative School, uh, which is based on the Lynn Scott campus. They are not charged for rent. Uh, my child attends that uh, cooperative. Um, I don't fundraise for rent. I fundraise um, 
the, there's no rent. They don't have to pay for the $1 million liability insurance. They don't have to pay for custodians. So it's not quite exactly the same, okay? So the cost to the Sa Santa Cruz area cooperatives, it's at a much greater scale, not just because of the benefits and the salaries. So it, it and like Nancy said, there, there are the Santa Cruz block grant funds yep. that you, know, you can use to hire uh, or create another administrative coordinator position for adult education, or you can use that money for two or three years to help the nonprofits consolidate and figure out what they need to do. I mean, that's, that would be the responsible thing to do. Mm. So let, me, let me tell you, there are three separate nonprofit agencies. They have not talked about consolidating at all. They have not said that. They all want to have their independent schools. They've had them for years. Um, two of the schools do not pay rent because they're held on school campuses. The other one is at a church, and we had a conversation. They said, well, I'm not sure we can really afford that. And I said, well, then maybe you need to move to a, another school site if you don't want to pay the rent of the church. So we've had talks about the, the rent fees because that's, that's a cost. So my, my uh, question would be then, the, li the liability of our district would be what if, if it failed? If, if, if all this failed, who's, what's, what's the financial li uh, liability to us? See, it would be the, the uh, Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz um, block grant funds. It's a Santa Cruz site. Hmm. Maria, I have a question. Sure. Um, and Nancy, I'm going to direct this to you, but it's going to be short and simple and direct. Um, you know, so it, it sounds like a lot of this is circled around past superintendents, past governing boards for this district. But as Michelle alluded to, you know, this is where we're at here now, right now, today. This was put in consent agenda. I'm taking in the district's administration's direction to put it through and pass it. It sounds like you and Chona and Francisco have had some in-depth conversations about it, um, and we're hearing what Francisco's concerns are, which I'm sure you've heard. So just point direct, you're the head of the adult education for our school district. Your position on moving forward on this tonight would be a yes vote or a no vote with regards to these three MOUs. Well, the MOUs came forward, and I would like to have them approved, but by the same token, I hear Francisco talking about um, this fundraising for the teachers. Now, it was my understanding that the teachers, that the union did not want the teachers to fundraise for their positions. That's item number six, so that's why it says that they can't fundraise for their positions. Um, we may have a difference of opinion. I don't know, but I... Uh, I thought we were doing what, uh, w we've been working on this for months with these groups, the PENS groups. So you know, the way that I read item number six is that they are, are not required or allowed to do board work, which I think that could be appropriate. I mean, we wouldn't want them to be doing the work of the board. They have more important things to do teaching children. Right, so it's it shouldn't be up to them to raise the funds for their school and for their job if they want to participate in an auction after hours or whatever. Obviously, they should be able to do that. So, is the concern that they would be pre precluded from doing those activities? Or our concern stems from the fact that the teachers were being sent the invoices. The teachers were being asked to give it to the board president to pay. They, they were being put in a position um, that is really not appropriate because they, they're, issue, though, than item six. they're benefiting okay. from it. And, and is that something that we could correct easily? Could that just go to whoever happens to be the bookkeeper or the tr board treasurer? Or? Well, that has, from my understanding, that has been corrected. 
uh, teachers are no longer being sent invoices or being asked to pay or any of that or being called during the summer to you know make a payment it, it's it's uh, so that piece has been resolved um, however our concern now is that um, the language on, uh, on number six uh, does not allow the teacher to participate in uh, fundraising um, which, you know, like I stated before, um, every other teacher in the district participates in fundraising. They participate to supplement um, the program. They've, uh, sometimes they may want to go on a field trip and, you know, they help with the fundraiser. So um, is it possible that we approve these MOUs tonight striking item six? So the, the issue is that you're going to have the, um, the superintendent uh, mentioned earlier that we have some disagreement as to whether or not this affects the uh, layoffs or not, the, you know, or, or if there's going, you know, how, how is this going to, um, to work? And the, the MOU that you have with Santa Cruz City Schools, um, I think, has a um, uh, we we interpret it in a way, and we have a tentative agreement on um, that there were going to be different service areas, and it does not impact the layoffs, but it impacts how teachers are assigned uh, are given assignments, and we have a current uh, active grievance on that, um, not involving any of the six uh, teachers. Um, so we think that, um, again, the responsible thing to do is to allow the, the, uh, some time for the uh, nonprofits to decide uh, what they want to do. And um, that's why we ask that um, uh, you know, there'd be more conversation as to how, how to do that. So Nancy, is there a time, Dr. Belisic, is there a timeline that is, um, that we need to have these approved? Are we looking? Basically, we've been talking and talking and talking about these for over a year, trying to say, let's go, we've got to get these signed. You're operating and we don't have an MOU. In fact, we told them that for eighteen nineteen, we want the MOUs to come to the board in May. We don't want to wait until another, well, we're just gonna continue. These are their annual MOUs. And finally, when they said, okay, we agree to this, and we had th three different sets of parents agree and sign off, um, we thought we were good to go because that's where we are. This part about the teachers, um, okay, that they, we will not require or allow, I mean, you could strike the word allow to be involved in um, board work such as fundraising for teachers' salaries. Well, like I said, I thought that they did, the union did not want them to be involved in fundraising for their salaries. Um, but then it'll have to go back again to these boards, the nonprofit boards, each one of them, to make sure that they're okay with the new language because they signed off on these. Michelle, you had something to add? Yeah, so I, I know it's more, more work for the staff, but the, the question is, is if we can get, um, and I can be in the room as well, if we can get all of us in the room at the exact same time um, and hash it out to where we can take, bring it back to the next board meeting. So I think it's, it, it sounds like it's a little bit more than just number six. Um, that there's some other things that we need to do. I recognize that staff has been has been working on it. I mean, I've I've heard it at, at multiple weekly meetings. The the concern, but I think um, maybe what we need to do is get everybody in the room at the exact same time. And the reason why I was on consent is because we thought we thought that it it was non controversial. Obviously, that wasn't correct. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, otherwise, so. But this pens part is not, it's not the big issue. The other issue is the major MOU. Yeah. That's separate from this. Yeah. I just think that they're, they are intertwined. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, 
if, unless there's an issue where we're not going to be able to pay someone the next month, which I don't want that to happen. So, so help me if there's unintended consequences to postponing it, but I'd rather get everybody in the room, figure out whatever changes need to happen, and then we'll move it, we'll bring it back March 14th, and we'll make sure that um, everybody's smiling the next time. <laughs> okay, I, I okay. would agree with that, just the fact that we just spend 40 minutes um, discussing this item. I think that the board has uh, lots of questions to get answered. Uh, let me make the motion happen. to table this this item until the next board meeting. And we will be tabling, um, well, we have to vote on them each individually. Okay, can we get a second? I'll second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 601. All right, item 12.4. I move to postpone until the, the meeting of 314. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 601. Item 12.5. I move to postpone 12.5 to the meeting of 314. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 601. And thank you, Nancy. Thank you. OK. Now moving on to item 14, report out on uh, on closed session. Jeff. Uh, uh, item 2.1, I move to approve the certificated employee report with the addition of one counselor under new hires and 13 teachers, two principals, one speech and language specialist under separations. We got second. a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Willie, yes, no? Yes. Okay. Whatever it is. Zero yeah. six, six zero one. Uh, okay. I know. Uh, two point two. I move to approve the classified employee report with the addition of one operations supervisor under separation from service. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries six zero one. In the, under two point three, the power value. Okay, as as its regularly scheduled meeting on February twenty eighth, twenty eighteen, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Governing Board of Trustees approved the settlement and release agreement with the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers and Certificated Employee Number five two seven zero. We had six yeses, no zero noes, and one absent. On two point eight. The board approved the non-reelection of 21.8 FTE certificated probationary employees. Employee ID numbers 7672, 7050, 770, 1175, 7875, 7622, 7671, 6685. I will get Leslie for this. 7680. 7704, 7834, 7231, 6683, 7075, 3961, 7692, 7690, 7723, <laughs> 7083, 7618, 6991, and 7722. Oh, Thank you. Woo. Woo. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. So our next board schedule meeting would be March twenty, March 14th. And at that meeting, we will be approving the second interim report. And so with that, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. All right. One minute to log.